Hey guys, welcome back to Magic TV. My name's Craig. It is nine o'clock on a Friday, which means it's time for another video. And today we're going to give you a sneak peek, a pull behind the curtain, so to speak, at what happens in the Netrix. So if you don't know, Netrix is my online streaming platform for magicians. There's a bronze level, there's a silver level, there's a gold level. The gold level has been oversubscribed since the day I launched it. That's where I personally mentor people on a one-to-one -one basis. The bronze level is all about tricks. You get like hundreds of tricks and slights and moves and theory and so on and so forth and the silver level is all about community and the silver level is a bunch of stuff that goes on but every week we have a vmc which takes place over zoom and then we uh we record it and put it into the archive so when you join at the silver level you've got access to every single um <clears throat> vmc since the netrix began over two years ago and uh they're all about a different thing. You know, some of the VMCs are about moves or learning tricks. Some of them are about business. Some of them are Q&As. And every month I try to do a masterclass with a particular magician. Um, we've had people like Kyle Purnell, Justin Miller. Uh, we've had people like David Jonathan, Nicholas Mavresis. The list goes on and on and on. I tell you this because... I'm actually sharing this week's masterclass with you because it was kind of a different one. Uh, this uh, Yesterday, we did a uh, Q&A with Matt Cluley and it went around about three hours. Uh, we normally do them on the weekend, but we did it on the Thursday. So we had a few people joining. A lot of people have uh, watched it on catch up. But Matt ans ass answered any and all questions that were thrown at him. Now, obviously, everybody on this channel knows Matt has been around on Magic TV for a very long time. He's new into magic, uh, but he performs more than most. And more importantly, his background in theatre, his background as an actor, has really helped skyrocket and catapult his career. And some of the questions were a bit mental, to be perfectly honest. Some of them were just bonkers. But a lot of the questions were really insightful and Matt's answers were fantastic. So I wanted to actually put it up so that everybody could see this Q&A. And there a lot of people that watch Magic TV, love Matt Cluley and uh, want to hear more from him. So this is basically what happened in the VMC last night. It is a full Q&A with Matt Cluley, taking people's questions, answering them. And if you find the time to listen to this, it's amazing because he gives so much insight into performing, into uh, performing on stage, choreography. It's incredible. It's a really great Q&A to listen to. So I'm going to play this now, but please don't forget, if you want to join the Netrix, see what all the fuss is about, go to www.thenetrix.com. You can go and get access to it immediately. Try it out and see what you think. We've got a 0.047% consolation rate and more people are signing up now than ever before. The buzz is awesome about the Netrix. So if you want to join, you can. Um, and if anybody's around in Wessex on Sunday, come and say hi to me and Ryland. I'm lecturing and Ryland's in the gala show. Anyway, thank you so much. I will see you again soon. My name's Craig and this is Magic uh, TV. Matt Cluley Q&A, which is very, very exciting. So like I was saying, uh, I've known Matt for many, many years. Uh, the first time I met him, he tried to book me for his uh, wedding. Uh, he did book me for his wedding. Uh, as a magician, he ended up cancelling um, because the wedding never went ahead, which is probably the best thing that ever happened to him. Um, yep. Then a few years later, he joined my company and, uh, uh, you know, is an incredible salesperson, but also has been performing his entire life. Year and a half ago, he started learning magic on the Um A year and a half later, he's performed at the Blackpool Magic Convention in the Bear Pit, performed at the House of Secrets. Is probably as busy as any working professional magician in the UK right now. Has three gigs this weekend, I think. Um, all yeah. over the country. Uh, uh, he's, uh, you know, gravitated towards mentalism. Uh, but he's done, uh, yeah, although he's got his very limited experience when it comes to magic, I'm sure you guys all know in, um, you know, he's he's performed literally all over the world. Last year, he was on tour as the narrator in the Rocky Horror Show. He's fronted his own metal band. Uh, he's uh, been a musician for years, a musical theatre. Uh, he's also Ryland's uh, choreographer and trainer. So Ryland has regular lessons with him uh, most weeks. And if you've ever seen an improvement in Ryland, a big part of that is Matt. And let's not forget the single most important Matt fact that we all need to remember and never, ever forget. He was once a backup dancer for Take That. 
It's just brilliant. It's the best thing ever. So I'm going to spotlight him on the screen, ask him lots of questions. There are no stupid questions. Uh, and he'll answer them all, regardless of what they are. So let's give a big round of applause to the one and only, always incredible, absolutely awesome, Matt Cluley. I'm putting you on screen, Matt. It's all on you. Cheers. No problem. <laughs> I can see people are already asking questions, so I'm going to unmute. Is these. that what the little hands are for? Yeah, so uh, we've got lots okay. of questions, I imagine. So Tom's hand went up first, so I'm going to take them in order. I'll introduce them, and then you can go and uh, go for the question. So first of all, Tom, <clears throat> you're on with Matt. Hi, Matt. Uh, do you if prefer... you were to ask me something, you could have just called me. <laughs> <laughs> do you prefer a 24-hour clock or a 12-hour clock? 24. Thank you. <laughs> wow. Wow. That, brilliant. Okay. Thanks. I have Andrew, to say, it's these, it's these quality questions. It is. Yeah. This is going to be a really it's, short VMC if that's the. It's the, it's the quality questions like that. The, the kind of question that we're being yeah. I mean, 24, though, definitely to the point where when I first got. Oh, you, you muted yourself, Matt. I muted myself. It said the host has muted you, which means you muted me. No, I didn't I didn't mute you, Matt. Carry on. What were you saying? Okay. To the point where when I Oh Matt, you muted again. You muted again, Matt. I'm so sorry. I don't know what's happening. It's a glitch on Zoom. So sorry. Right. Can you hear me? Yes. What were you saying? You're Matt? doing Go that ahead. on purpose, aren't you? Because I said I'm most really not doing it on purpose, Matt. Go right ahead. I'm so sorry. Don't know what's happening. It's a glitch on Zoom. Carry on. When I got my latest motorbike. Oh, mate, I'm sorry. It's 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 glitching. It's Zoom. It's a nightmare, Matt. I, I, I Try again. Should we just go to the next question? No, no, I, I, I will behave now, I promise. I'll... When I got my latest motorbike, the clock was in 12-hour format, and I had to Google it, and it took me about an hour to figure out how to get into 24 hours. That's how much I would prefer 24 hours. Just so you know, Tom. Thank you, thank you. Uh, You're so welcome. I've always, I've always struggled with a 24 hour clock, and uh, I admire that you've. So she can't to... count above 12. Yeah, and uh, because there just isn't enough uh, fingers and toes. No. But you are my inspiration to keep pushing and get to that level. Thank you, Matt. Brilliant. You're welcome. <laughs> I would, so I would like to point out, Thomas, by the way, <laughs> that. Uh, you come from Matlock. If there's ever a place in the world where there's a good chance that people have got more than ten toes, it's it's probably there. That is, after all, I love Matlock. It's Mary. But anyway, uh, let's move on, and we will continue with Andreas. Can you bring a bit of normality and professionalism to this? Uh, <laughs> yes, yes, of course, of course. Because because I just recently ordered mine from the Prop Docs. I have a question for you about about the close up pad or mat you're using. So are you prefer are you preferring something like a simple roll up mat, a thin layer? Are you are you using the TCC sponge map, or are you using the the, the wooden stuff with the double layer cushion thing when you when you go to your per, uh, your your favorite football club and sit down in the back roof of the stadium. This may be a better question for Craig because I don't even use the close up pad. <laughs> I, I don't think Matt ever uh, has used the close up pad. He I've never used the close up pad. I don't, um, I don't use it. I use a Sven and Bosch, and that's my favorite mat. Um, I have the I have the prop dog mat. The ones so that we've got in the in the marketing room that we do the tricks on when we're doing the mat and the Craig tests and stuff, they're pretty cool. Yeah, that's the that's the uh, that's the Sven and Borsch pads. Uh, yeah, but, but, but do you use that also for for sitting down in in the football stadium? I don't do football. when you need some support for your. Do you button. do magic tricks in a football stadium? No, but sometimes you need support for your button when you sit down. Because this, the benches are quite stiff and hard. Oh, I see. Yeah, my, maybe my I could put one on my bike on long journeys. journeys. I'd just like to point out to Raina that it's not normally as insane as this. Normally, there's actually a plan when it comes to these VMCs. And it's not as completely batshit mental as it is right now. But, you know, this is what happens when you let the, uh, when you, when you, uh, you let the inmates run the asylum. Right, Matt? 
Well, yeah, it's quite like I said, anybody can ask me anything they wanted. If Andreas wants to know about what's the best close up mat to sit on, then we'll go with yours. Right. Okay. Well, that was a great question. Thank you, Andreas. But now <laughs> I'm going to my second backup plan. I'm going to get Chris to ask a question that I think hopefully will will bring some normality back to the proceedings. Chris Who wants normality. Normality. What have you got? Chris, you've got to unmute yourself, dude. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. This is Zoom. I swear. No. Uh, okay, so I do have a question for you. I have thought about this. So I was wondering, you've now made transitions through uh, the arts, through performance, through singing, through acting, and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. Now you've been a magician for a couple of years, year and a half, two years, right? Presenting. Right. What three things, what are the top three surprises or things you didn't realize going in to being in magic versus your other arts that surprised you but were powerful takeaways over the last couple of years? The main thing that I've noticed more about performing magic as opposed to performing anything else is that magic is so much harder, like a lot harder. When you are... Because whenever I walk out onto a stage, Craig's the exact opposite to me. Craig will literally just have a rough idea in his head about what he wants to do and then just walk out onto a stage and make it up as he's going along. That's not how I've been taught. So as an actor, as a musical theatre performer, we have months and months and months and months and months of rehearsals and training and directors and choreographers and producers that tell you exactly what to say, when to say, where to stand, blah, blah, blah. So you've got it all in your head before you walk out on stage. You've got... You're surrounded by other people on the stage as well. So if you forget a line or you get a line a little bit wrong or you're standing in the wrong place, there's always someone that can kind of pick you up and then they get you back on track and you and then it clicks your head back in and you're like, oh yeah, crap, okay, I should have said that. Sorry, blah, blah, blah. And then you always get round to the point. And then with choreography and stuff, you've got a choreographer that's like, you need to go and stand there and walk there this way. And when you're walking there, you say this in this way and blah, 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 blah. Magic, you can't. You can't do that. Magic, you can't, as much as I like rehearsing the tricks that I'm doing, you can't rehearse them to within an inch of their lives because so much more stuff can go wrong mm -hmm. with a magic trick. And you have to be able to think on your feet and just get out of any situations that you're in. But when you walk onto the stage to do a magic trick, I'm thinking about where I'm standing. I'm thinking about what I'm going to say, how I'm going to say it, where I need to go next, blah, 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 blah. But you're doing all of the same stuff that you do when you're doing theatre or acting, but you're doing it while trying to do a magic trick. So you've got all the extra stuff that comes with performing a magic effect on top of everything else that's already going through your brain. And it's just, it's taken a long time to kind of configure my head to be able to think about the magic trick as well. Because all I've ever done throughout my whole career is think about what I'm what I'm saying or what I'm how I'm standing or whatever. But right. then when you're doing a magic trick, a lot of the time that goes out the window because you're concentrating so hard on the magic. So it's got you've got to find that balance. And that's been really difficult for me because it's something that's completely out of my my comfort zone. And it's not the way that I've been trained. So finding that balance, that's been really difficult. Um the Another thing that's way different with everything else that I've ever done is like being able to collaborate with people. Like you can help, you can get like help from people to a degree when you're learning a role, like for music or theatre, you can say, oh, I don't know, like this accent or that accent or blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> and you can talk to people and you could get advice and stuff. But within magic, there's so many different ways of doing one thing. So you can have one effect, but then there's a gazillion ways of putting that effect across. So you can, there's so many people that have got so many different ideas and it's being able to, to trawl through everything to find the thing that's going to work best for yourself. So just the, like if I do a trick, me and Ryland and Craig could all walk onto a stage and do exactly the same trick, mm -hmm. exactly the same trick the audience watching would think it was three completely different tricks because of how different we'd perform them. So mm -hmm. having that being able to hone your own style is way different to B 
being doing anything else that I've ever done. And then the third thing is being me, which is the single hardest thing that I've had to deal with since doing magic is being myself. Because whenever I've walked onto stage with a band, I've got to be that guy. I put right. on a persona. My name is on the banner, but I've got to put my persona across of being a singer in a metal band. When I walk onto a stage as a musical theatre guy, I'm the character that I'm playing. When I get an acting role, I am the character that I'm playing. And you've got that kind of cloak to hide behind. Whereas when I walk out on stage as a magician, I'm me. And that is truly, for someone that's always struggled, I know it's, people are like, yeah, 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 whatever. But I've always struggled with self-confidence. I've always struggled with self-esteem, always. I've not got any confidence in myself when I walk out onto a stage. I stand backstage and I shake uncontrollably for five minutes. Craig's seen me. We did a theatre like last week and I was standing backstage and I was just shaking uncontrollably. And he looked at me, he's going, you're all right. And I was like, I'm just really nervous. And he's like, you're nervous. And I was like, yeah, I'm fucking terrified. Absolutely terrified. And he's like, still. And I'm like, yes. And I always will be. Um, so the, And then walking out on stage and Craig goes, this is Matt. And I'm like, holy shit, like, it's actually me. It's not a character that I'm playing. This yeah. is actually me. And that is the single hardest thing I've had to deal with and the single biggest difference from doing anything else that I've ever done. In magic, I'm me, and that's it's terrifying, scary. All right. I appreciate it. No worries, dude. Very right, cool. That's a very good answer. Very good answer. Thank you, Matt. I don't know if I answered the question, but... <laughs> You did. No, that was excellent. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. <laughs> I have questions, but I'm going to hold off for a bit because everybody else wants to ask questions. So okay. here's Thomas. let's try and oh, do a question God. that's not about the 24-hour clock. <laughs> this is going to be an incredibly ridiculous question. That was a great answer, by the way. Honestly, I, don't know. I like that. Um, the, my next question is, who do you think will win Big Brother? Um... 100% honest answer? Yeah. I know. Can we, can we, oh, no, you don't watch it. Cause I was going to no. say, who do you think will win and who do you want to win? Okay. So, um, okay. Uh, I haven't watched Big Brother since like the first season and I only partially watched that. Okay. Who do you okay. think's going to win? Well, I want to, I want Louis Walsh to win. Oh, is it a celebrity one? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Louis, okay. why would you want to do it? What is the caliber of the other people on this show if you want Louis Walsh to win? There was Sharon huh? Osbourne. Sharon Osbourne was in there. Was? Yeah. She, uh, they, they could only afford to have her in for like a week. So she came in for a week and then left. Right. Yeah. So for well, Louis Walsh, she's obviously a lot cheaper. Actually, I, I love that you're actually taking these questions and trying to answer them in a credible way. That's. Uh, <laughs> Consummate I've, professional, I've, dude. One more to the subject matter. Got one more to the subject matter. Uh, who would win in a fight between Jack and Michael? Oh, that's um. Neither of them are big fighters, I don't think. Um, but Jack does train at the gym, and he does use a heavy bag. So, yeah. I mean, Mike's a lot taller though, so he's got like the reach. Whereas Jack's Jack's been training to do the London Marathon next month, so he's probably fitter yeah, at the moment. So I, re I reckon if Mike could land a clean shot, Jack yeah. could be in trouble. But if Jack was able to duck and weave and move around and like he'd just be like a little little Rottweiler, um, you know, if it was a long game, probably Jack. If Mike could land a decent shot, probably Mike. That's a great answer. That's a great answer. Just one more, because I, I have written these down. So this is how serious they are. You can tell um, he's been a tip by the tone of his voice, because this is his <laughs> own being a bell end voice. How many forks? That's how well own? I know Tom at this point. I know you're this is I'm being a bell end voice. How many forks do you own? Forks? Yeah. As in dinner forks? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Six. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, thanks very much for the question, Tom. That Four of them are from a set that I got, which is one complete set. Yeah, yeah, and then yeah. two are left over from a previous set that I've just brought with me to the new place. But yeah, six. Andreas, please save me. <laughs> Try to come up with something slightly 
<laughs> intelligent. I would really Before appreciate Before we come to the point, Matt, Matt, I have a question for you. One, yes. two, three, four, five, or six? Four. That's correct. Thank you. Yeah. And um, <laughs> right, right. By, by, by going with four, uh, technically, Craig just had these um, openings with coins video up the other day. And uh, in that video, he well, re revamped your, I, I don't, I don't recall if he, if he showed that or if I intentionally rewatched it, but the reaction, your reaction on the apparition presentation that Craig has, has given you on the, on the math test. Okay. And, and you, 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 you did react it twice or three times to one of his apparition set um, presentations. And I must, I must admit your reaction was priceless. This, this shiny bright eyes, this naive grin of, of a mugger. Um, <laughs> well, nowadays, twofold of the question, nowadays you will not have that any longer because almost everything you know about it. It's a, it, it, it's hard to to get that type of reaction when you when one ever performed magic on on your own. So how do you feel with that? And second is, have you ever rewatched these things, and well, re-entered the the mood by watching yourself reacting that way that you originally did nowadays? So um, what, what, what feelings do you have when you when you see such? reactions of yours from two years ago okay i don't watch them i haven't watched them back i didn't watch them at the time because i'm not a massive fan of watching myself um but i do remember them i remember um the one that sticks out the most is one of the first videos that we did i think i remember seeing lux and i remember the feeling of what the hell just happened like how is that it genuinely blew me away and there's been so many since apparition and so many different tricks that he showed me in the early days of the mat test where i'm just like this this is just it's impossible it's impossible that that could i mean looks now i have it <laughs> it's in my close-up case <laughs> oh, <of course. laughs> so i know exactly how it works and i've performed it many 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 times um but at the time that genuinely <laughs> just I was completely staggered, like by a lot of the stuff that I saw. And people are always saying to me, "Oh, you know, you know, you an actor? Is are you are you putting any element of this on?" And I'm like, "No, like I'm genuinely not. Like that that is how I react to magic." And as far as not having that as much anymore, then yeah, I don't because I've, I've kind of had a chance to peek beyond the curtain, and you know, I've seen a lot of magic, like a lot over the years on the videos and learning stuff. And I've had a really <laughs> steep learning curve into magic where I've just been, I mean, this is just, this goes down another three shelves and up another two, and it's just solid with magic. So there's a lot of the methods and stuff I know now, and but there's still loads of stuff that I don't. Like at Blackpool this year, there was people coming up to me showing me stuff and I had no idea how it worked. And like at the session, we went down to the session, there was loads of people just coming up to me and showing me stuff. And I'm just like, no, not a clue. And I still get that. I still get that feeling of, oh my God. I was uh, running around the Ruskin a couple of times, just going, holy shit, you've got to come and see this. You've got to friends and stuff going, you've got to come and see this. This is incredible. And it's, um, I, I still get that very much so. And I love the fact that I, I, that I still get that feeling. I, I want to be fooled. I want to not know how things are done. Me and Craig filmed a trick today um, that's going to be going up on the channel, and it blew me away. I've got absolute, I had at the time no idea how it was done. And I love that feeling. I love the feeling of, of not knowing. And I, I, I still get that. And everybody, if, there's no magician on the planet that knows everything. Craig's pretty close, but there's still got to be stuff out there that Craig doesn't know. There will be something eventually that comes along that I'll show him and it'll fool him. He won't know how it's done. 
And you said the the one that we filmed today, he was like, when I got first shown this, I had it fooled me as well. I had no idea. And it's brilliant. So I, I do still get that. And I hope that never goes away. Thank you. I've got You're a welcome. serious question now. It is serious, honestly. Oh, God, here we go. No, 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 it's serious. Honestly, I put the book away now. Oh, his voice has changed. He's gone back yeah. to, okay. This will be a proper question. This, this mentalism stuff's real for you, isn't it? You know, <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I was listening to the podcast the other, I think it was last night. Um, and there were the new trick, the coin trick. I can't remember where it's called. Uh, I think Craig said that you said, oh, I'm never going to be able to do that because of the technical ability. Are you, Just, you know, in case you haven't listened to the podcast yet, I haven't talking about hot, but me and Lloyd had a lengthy discussion about hot by uh, the 1914. And I told that. Lloyd, yeah. And I told Lloyd, you were very disappointed in it. And one of the reasons you were disappointed is because the method involves sleight of hand of which you have no experience of. And it means that the learning curve is a lot steeper. And I don't, I don't like it as well for various different reasons. Listen to the podcast, but basically, I, I told Lloyd that you don't particularly care for it because of various different reasons. But one of which is you were like, I don't know how to do coin magic. I don't do coin magic, and I have to do coin magic to do this. Yeah, but I mean, I did buy a coin trick, so yeah, I can't. You know what I mean? I can't be. I, it was the method wasn't what I was what I thought it was going to be. Yeah. So, it, and from what a couple of people had said before it came out, I was expecting it to be different to what it is. Mm. And Wait a second. You, you bought a magic trick and the method wasn't what you expected it to be? Yes. Welcome to magic. I know, right? <laughs> I know, I know. My, my, my main question is, has there been anything that's like really got you that you really want to do, but you're just like, Damn, that's a that's a steep learning curve, but I want to do it. Is it that? Yeah, that... Like everything. Okay, oh, that was my question. <laughs> What's that one trick that Matt clearly wants to do, but it does mean going down to? I'm going to have to put a, a bit of time into this, and you know, I mean, serious time. For it. There's so much stuff. When I watched the Thirteen Steps Mentalism and did the review on that, there was so much stuff in there that I was just like, I'd love to be able to do that. But, and it's the same kind of feeling before I started doing magic at all. I've always, people think that I just started working for Craig and then talked into learning magic. That's not the case. I've always loved magic. I booked Craig for my wedding before I knew him. I really desperately wanted him. That was my only kind of, that you can pick the venue, you can pick the flowers and whatever, and you just do everything. As long as I get a magician at my wedding, I don't care. You can do everything else. That was the conversation we had. I desperately, desperately wanted a magician at my wedding. Um, and I've been to see Darren, and I've been to see loads of magicians before I was anything to do with the magic world. I used to, just, used to go as a muggle and just go and watch magicians perform. I love it, genuinely love it. And there's a lot of things that I, I look at now and still see and just it's the same feeling that I had before. The reason that I never started doing magic years ago is because out of all the things that I do, theatre and singing and blah, 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 it was it just looked too far out of reach. It just looked like I'm never... In my head, my head was like, you're never going to be able to do that. You're never going to be able to do that. And it's that self-doubt and that, that lack of self-esteem, that lack of confidence in myself. I was just like, there's no way. There's no way. Um. And I still get that with a lot of stuff now. I'll look at people like Darren perform, like Alex Marsh, and you know these incredibly good mentalists that do all these incredible peaks and they're holding things behind boards and you know what I mean? All this really complicated stuff. And I'm looking at it just thinking, I wish I could do that. I wish I could do it. And I've just got to get over that he that thing in my head that stopped me even starting in the first place. But I've come so far now and I do know a lot of stuff and I've been practicing and practicing and like going out there and gigging and doing stage shows. And, and I think that I just need to get over that hurdle of you can't do this. So it's a constant battle with myself in order to be able to do all of these things, but there's loads of stuff. There's loads. And it's like, have you watched the 13 steps of mentalism? 
Uh, yeah, the original one. It's the same DVDs, isn't it? So I've, yeah, yeah, yeah. The they've just one. broke it down and stuff. But there's the one with the map where he puts the pin in the map, and I'm like, yeah, it's the easiest thing in the in world to do. The easy thing in the world to do. You've just got to have balls to do it. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, there's loads. There's loads. Lo- loads of di- different peaks and stuff, which I don't feel like I've got the dexterity for or the the confidence for. Loads of stuff that you do. I've watched you perform when we've been at close up gigs and. I just need to build my confidence up a little bit more because I'm just running at the moment on yeah. my previous existing skills as a performer and just doing pretty much self-working stuff that I'm just able to sell the crap out of. But I do need to enhance my skills as a magician, I think. I think but the yeah, first great, great. time you me was back in time, though. And that that takes, that's takes got a slight, slight, you know, you had a decent slice with that back in time. It's one double lift. Yeah, the double lifts are hard. <laughs> oh, well, I can do a double lift. Yeah. Um, so. And a Charlie shuffle. <laughs> but that's, yeah, that's <laughs> about the level of card skill that I've got, I think. I don't really do anything more than more than that when it comes you to... Need, you don't need more than a double lift, that's it. <laughs> yeah, yeah well... So are that. you wanting to learn more card stuff? Like, or is it because... Like, because I know a lot of mentalists that have incredible card skill. Yeah, like of course. At, uh, you look at, because you've been, and, and I'm not dissing you at all, but you've been doing magic for a year and a half now, and you've had such a upward trajectory, and you've thrown yourself into so many scenarios. But one thing that you've not done is kind of learn moves <laughs> and improved your skill with the deck of cards. Really, like no, it's, I haven't. It's, you know, I remember sitting with you when you first started and you spent hours learning how to do a waterfall shuffle and how to do a double lift. And you spent a long time learning how to control a card. And then you kind of got to a point where you're like, actually, I can use a Stebbins deck instead. You know, like, <laughs> is, there a reason, Very much. is there a reason why you've not kind of focused on learning more sleight of hand? Because for me, I love collecting sleight of hand techniques. It yeah. helps, like, like, Half the stuff that I create and market wouldn't exist if I didn't have that skill set or that knowledge. Because when I'm, because I know you, I know one of your goals, and we can talk about this later. I know one of your goals is to be a creator and to create magic. Having a sound knowledge of moves and slights and techniques makes creating magic so much easier. You know, you seeing me do it, I can, someone can say to me, I want to do this. And I can come up with about seven different ways of doing it because I've got that knowledge of all of that moves and all of those moves. And I can go, well, if you tried this move with this and you did this and you did this and you did this, that would get you to the end result. It's a little yeah. bit, I imagine, like musical theatre and having a big range of notes and a big, you know, rather than just having one skill, having multiple skills, you, you can come into it in a different way. So is there a reason you've not kind of focused on learning more that involves skill and instead you you know i think about all of the stuff you do you know rest re- your show at the house of secrets is amazing but it was re- rex ignis completely mm-hmm. self-working the imposter completely self-working uh psychology completely self-working you know i look at your close-up set that you do a lot of the time when you're gigging completely self-working you look at the bear mm-hmm. pit, completely self-working there's no skill that's shown anywhere now there is a skill the skill in the way you present it and i've said many many times you're one of the best presenters of mentalism and magic that i've ever seen especially after being in it for such a short period of time and i think that's because of your background but are we going to get to a point where you're just going to start taking the other side of things? I don't want to say more seriously, but because, I mean, you're gigging. You're gigging more than most people. You don't need this stuff. But I know you've got goals that you want to hit I don't need in the community that are going to be helped by having that knowledge. Yes, yeah, I don't need it, but I do want it. What I want to collect more than anything else is peaks. <laughs> I really want to get loads of peaks down because i think peaks are going to really help me with various different routines and being able to put other stuff together and starting to come up with my own stuff is yeah i want to i want to put as many peaks together as as i can get in my pocket and it's learning stuff all the time and doing buying downloads and you know what i mean just trying to absorb as much stuff as as physically possible so um yeah but peaks are definitely i want to work on being able to do more with cards because i think that's important and I really want to start collecting as many peaks as I possibly can. So that is definitely a goal moving forward short term.
Good answer. Very good Thanks, answer. Sir. No problem. Do we have more questions? If not, I've got a plenty. Uh, I, I have I have a comment. I have a comment and that, that matches a little bit in the direction with the slides and learning curve and okay. what Matt earlier said. I I've, I've, I think yesterday I watched a video from Kevin Booth and he, he, he nailed it with a point. If you are a professional basketball player, when you perform, you are showing off. You're showing off your skills. Everybody can see how great you are, how you dribble the ball through your legs and through the ears and pulling it out of the nose and in, into the basket and things like that. And, and you can exaggerate that to every art, art, art type of art. When you're a magician, the best showing off is when nobody sees what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. Which is quite absolutely. the opposite. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, very much so. So the whole idea of being a magician is that nobody knows what you're doing. Or it makes it look like you're doing one thing when you're really doing something You're else. just doing nothing. Very, yeah. You're very doing deceptive. nothing. And that's the best showing off for a magician, which is not a showing off at all. And now we crashed him. That off. <laughs> it was on charge. No, it's not. Don't worry, it was seamless. Nobody noticed. Yeah, yeah, nobody noticed. It's all good. I forget who said it. I think it might have been Penn or Teller, but I think one of them said... Uh, Jugglers practice for hours a day so that everyone can see how good they are. And magicians yeah. practice hours a day so that no one sees how good they are. Exactly. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, co collecting a peak. Do, do you know this one? What? Uh, so you, so you have your mobile one? phone. You have yeah. something like a back you can put, put in a cart. And then by picking it up, it just opens and allows the peak. Oh, right. Okay, that's cool. I need to get an orphan. The one, Illusionist or 1914. I think it's Illusionist. I'm going to, yeah, I need to. Um, yeah, I think I need to get you an can orphan learn it for free by going to Javier Fuenmayer's YouTube channel where he published yeah, it yeah. a month earlier. I've, I've, I, mm. I've, seen, I've seen a self made thing for that. Yeah. What do you prefer, Matt? Close up. Or being on stage, the stage like your uh, stand-up magic or close-up magic. Which one? Which one do you want to? Which one do you prefer doing? It's a really good question, and lots of people have asked me that. Um, what I feel more comfortable with, for sure, is being on stage because that's what I do. That's where I feel at home. That's what I've done for so long. Whether it's music or theatre or whatever it is, um, I'm very comfortable being on a stage. So learning the magic to go with being on stage was was difficult um because it's out of my comfort zone like i was i was saying earlier it's different to just walking onto a stage and being a performer but when you're walking up and doing close up magic that is the single most terrifying thing that you can do <laughs> as a magician i think from the perspective of a performer who's used to being on stage walking up and, and doing close, working up to a, a group of people that don't necessarily even know that you're there or you're coming and then going, do you want to see some magic? Is absolutely terrifying. Like, and I still get way more nervous, even though I get nervous walking down to a stage to do magic, I still get way more nervous um, doing close up. Close up for me is, is that's so far out of my comfort zone of anything that I've done before. That that is that is terrifying. Because you do a really good job in close up. You really sell the mentalism as if it's real, the real deal. You know, cause, um, Thanks, when you've seen you perform, people are like following you to so you can educate them to learn it. Uh, I think <laughs> yeah. time, I'm like, so how do I learn this? How do I go about doing it? And then you just give them some bullshit. And yeah, yeah, really yeah. Total, total bullshit. Google just... neuro linguistic programming courses. I'm costing yeah. people thousands right. of pounds because everyone's signing up to neuro linguistic programming courses, yeah. um, thinking they're going to be able to do what I'm doing with a die. Um, but yeah, it's just being uh, uh, that comes from the acting, like just with the murder mysteries and stuff that we do. I've had that much experience of, of random performances and I'm just able, been really lucky to have all of those experiences and all of them in one way or another 
relate to performing magic all of them so like with being on a in a band that's commanding a stage that's being used to being the center of attention that's being able to project it's being able to confidently talk to a room full of people whether there's five of them or 500 of them and then the murder mysteries the the main thing i've got from that is is kind of like ad lib and just being able to make shit believable because you you know when you're an actor we get with the murder mysteries we get a backstory of everything that we you know that character is because there's certain parts of the murder mysteries where they're called walkarounds and they send us out into the theater or into the room or wherever it is that we're performing and the the guests the audience get to ask us questions and they can ask you anything and you have to know the answer so we get really really detailed backstories about our character that we have to sit and learn so that we we are basically becoming that person so that when people ask you questions you've got answers for it so that's really helped with the magic because I know what people are, how people's brains work. And I know that people are going to ask certain questions so I can have, I can do preparation. I can then know what those, like roughly what people are going to be asking me. Oh, where did you learn this? How much is it? How long does it take to learn? You know, who created this? Blah, 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 blah. Like with JB Ryan and stuff. If you just say, Oh yeah, there's a guy called JB Ryan did parapsychology. I go, okay, cool. Like how, where? I'm like, oh, I was so, from Duke University in America, the started in the early yeah. 1940s and blah, 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 blah. Because I've known to do more research ahead of time so that when people ask you stuff, if you can give them a confident answer, whether it's true or not, if you can give them a confident answer, they'll just go, okay, cool. And they believe you and you keep the upper hand. If you can keep the upper hand throughout the conversation and they don't trip you up, the second they trip you up, that's it. You've lost all credibility. Yeah. So as long as you can keep the upper hand and whatever they ask you, you always one step ahead of them. It's a great performance. So that's quite a good, that's quite a good thing. I think a lot of magicians don't actually do. You've invested quite a lot of time into your uh, backstory, processy sort of thing. So yeah. You know, so you, you, the, the things that may never ever get asked, you've got an answer for them. So I've got an answer for it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I've got an answer for most stuff because. I want to have. I don't want to be in a position where somebody asks me a question that I should know the answer to, and I don't, because that means everything else that I'm doing loses credibility instantly. The second you go, um, you've lost it. Gone. Game over. They they've won, and they fooled the magician, and they've made you look like an idiot in front of the rest of the table. And then all you can do is walk off with your tail between your feet, tail between your legs, and go to the next table. Whereas if you've got an answer, a confident answer to everything that they come at you with, you win every time. And so far, I haven't lost because I've done my homework. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. When I go to a gig, I make sure that I'm completely prepared, completely organized. I've got the answers for every question right there in my pocket so I can pull it out whenever I need it. Yeah. See, my, my answer to thing is, it's just a magic trick. Get over it. And then I move on. <laughs> but I but, don't do magic tricks. Yeah. To my yeah. customers, what I'm doing is the magic tricks. What I'm doing to my customers, customers, my clients, my guests, what I'm doing is science. So science has answers to questions. Neurolinguistic programming, reading facial reviews, ticks, expressions, tells, reading body language, blah, 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 blah. That's all science. So every single question they ask me has an answer. That's it's really not good. Just, so I've got, I, I know that Rainer has got a question for you, but Rainer, before you ask that question, can I just ask one question of Matt first, very quickly? Uh, as a follow-up to that, that's really interesting that you said that. Like, hey, I, uh, the people that watch me perform, I'm a scientist, you know, uh, I'm, 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 I'm showing them parapsychology and science and blah, 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 blah. Like, you man the phones in the sales department at, at Slightly Unusual. You yeah. are the person that's booking the events in and you're telling people, oh yeah, yeah, we're going to come along and we're going to do, um, uh, we're going to, you know, we're going to do magic. It's going to be absolutely amazing. Your guests are going to get blown away. Mm -hmm. But you're not actually telling people that you do magic. You're telling, you know, you're making them. So I've got a couple of questions on that. Genuinely interested. Number one, <laughs> like, so you don't, you're not trying to pretend that you're a magician. You're trying to pretend that you're kind of learning. You've learned this stuff and it's just uh, kind of trickery. And secondly, well, no, when you come back, I've got a follow-up question. Just one sec. Okay. When you do an illusion show with me, 
Yeah. We're standing on stage doing magic. We're putting a girl in the box. We're making them disappear. We're, we're, we're sawing somebody in half. We're like making stools disappear that they've been sitting on. Like we're doing all of that stuff. That is magic. But a lot of the time when we're doing an illusion show, you're doing close-up magic beforehand. Are you concerned as a follow-up question if you are telling people you're not doing magic and you're kind of doing the stuff that you're doing is explainable or psychology, science, whatever it may be. Are you are you are you concerned that, that then them seeing you in the show a little bit later on is almost trivializing that statement that you made when you were doing close up and almost making you out to be a liar? It's like, well, I told you that it was this, but now here I am doing a completely different thing. And that completely different thing is a way that you could explain what I was showing to you earlier on. Does that make sense? No, it's I'm I'm still a, I say that I'm classed as a mentalist, but like I start when I start off, I act like I'm actually reading people's minds. And I found from when I was when I'm doing that, you get a better reaction from people when you explain that I'm not I can't actually read your mind. But what I'm doing is this. And I found that the way that I perform and the way that I present it, I get a better reaction from doing that kind of stuff. I get a better reaction from telling people flat out, I'm not, I'm not actually reading your mind. And I make a joke about it because it freaks people out when you do it. And then you go, I'm not actually reading your mind. What I'm doing is this. I'm reading facial cues, ticks, expressions, tells, blah, 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 blah. And then you do it again. And then it's more interactive with people and more people get involved because all of a sudden they can look for what you're looking at and it brings people into the performance. But when we're doing magic on the stage, doing the illusions and stuff, obviously that's not, that is genuinely magic. That's making a fully grown woman completely disappear. And it's two completely different things. And I think people look at it differently from when you're doing close up to when you're on a stage. When you're on a stage, in front of a big group of people, you're putting on a show. And a lot of the stuff that I do, even when we do uh, like destination box during the show, I'll start off and I'll go, I'll play stuff around the room from when you came in and it's been subliminally going into your brain since the second you walked into the building. You haven't known it's there. If you've noticed it, it probably, it probably hasn't worked. But it's all suggestion. I'm suggesting this to you, which is a science. Do you know what I mean? It's still magic. It's still mentalism. But I'm not telling I'm them fine, that they're... I find that a very interesting approach. So you're kind of saying, hey, I'm going to read your mind. Bum, 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 bum. I'm not really reading your mind. Really, I'm kind of reading your body ticks and I'm doing this and I'm doing this and I'm doing this. So you're mm -hmm. giving them an answer. One of the reasons that a lot of magicians are scared of exposure uh, and people exposing magic on YouTube or whatever it may be is because they don't want people to have any answer to their magic at all. Because then if there's a salute uh, it's it's said a lot that like if somebody's got a solution for the trick then they're th th like so for example if i took a coin and made a coin disappear and put it in the other hand if somebody had a solution to that that wasn't the actual way it was done that i can't convince them otherwise that's it they're done so in sleight of hand when you're making a coin disappear or whatever it may be you don't want them to have any possible answer to it because then if they think they've got an answer they just think right that's it i know how it's done move on it's kind of like the equivalent of me coming out and doing a doing an ambitious card and saying hey look at this i make your card come to the top of the deck and make your card come to the top of the deck over and over again oh my god that's amazing well i'm not really making your cards come to the top of the deck really i'm turning two cards over but you think there's one card now in reality that's not what i was doing in reality I was using a Mirage deck or a Svengali deck. So there's 26 cards, but I've told them I'm, I'm doing a double lift now. So now I'm like, yeah, you turn two cards over. Let me show you the technique. Look, you turn them over like that. It looks like one card. And I'm actually using a Svengali deck. Isn't that kind of what you're doing? You're kind I'm of not... saying, I'm not reading minds. <laughs> I'm really doing that. Well, you're not doing that. You're doing that. But now they've got this solution for what they're seeing does it trivialize the performance a little bit is what I'm asking. Because it would do if I was doing that with magic. If I was doing an ambitious card and I told them I was turning two cards over as one, but in reality I was using a Svengali deck, it doesn't matter what method I'm using. I kind of said, this is how I'm doing it. I, I don't know. I don't know the answer. I'm not being a dick. I'm just really interested in, 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 <laughs> in your... I'm really interested because I didn't know you did that. And I'm, I'm fa I've never You've heard... You've seen me perform like that loads of times. 
Yeah, but I've never really thought it through. And, and and honestly, I've never seen another performer kind of go down that route. You see Darren sometimes Darren saying... Darren does it all the time. Well, he, loads says, of yeah, he says, I'm using neuro-linguistic programming and blah, 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 blah. But he doesn't go to the point of saying, uh, you know, now look at this. This is exactly how it works. You could do it as well. Have a look at this. You try it. Oh, my God, you've got it right. Do you know what I mean? I'm not saying it's wrong. It's a different approach. It's a very unique approach. Um. I just don't think I can pull that off because I think that from my experience when I'm doing magic and admittedly, I'm not a mentalist. I'm a magician. When I, I do magic, if I give them any solution to the trick I'm doing, then they've got the solution. They don't care anymore. They're done. Yeah. You know, I think a lot of people will make up solutions to things regardless. So I've been out before I was a magician, before I hung around with magicians or new magicians. And I went to the show with I went to see Darren Brown with some friends and there was a bunch of stuff that he did that I know now how he did it but at the time I had no idea and a couple of my friends that were sitting next to me during the interval after the first half of the show were like how do you think he did that and I was like not a clue don't know and they were like yeah but how do, how do you think he did it and I'm like oh, I don't know not a clue he's telling us that it's suggestion and he's reading people and he does entire shows because this was after his TV shows had been out where he went and completely disproved, um, completely disproved mediums and stuff by showing people how to cold read. So he did the whole thing on cold reading is real. This is a thing. You can do cold reading. Anyone can go and learn cold reading. It's going to take a long time. But anyone can learn how to cold read people, and that's what these mediums are doing. And he went to Liverpool and took out some Scouse guy who was supposedly this medium and just completely destroyed him. And he's been over to the States and completely disproven people that have said that they can change the way people think and they can make people ill better. And it's like it completely disproved the church and all different kinds of stuff, you know. And he's been out and proved this is how this is done that what they're saying is happening isn't true this is how it's done and he's done full tv series where he's gone out to various different parts of the world and just destroyed people by saying this is how it's done and i've watched that growing up as you know a performer and then coming into magic Darren brown to me is like a god he's one of the best showmen that this country if not the world has ever produced He's phenomenally good. And a lot of what he does, every single time I've seen him live, he's walked out onto stage and just gone, what I'm about to do is going to look like this. But that's not what it is. I'm, I'm not a mind reader. I can't read your mind. I'm not a medium. What I do is I use blah, 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 and the power of suggestion and influence and yada, yada, yada to get people to do what I want them to do. And he's done interviews and stuff where he's gone through how like he hypnotizes people. I know one of his techniques of how he hypnotizes people from watching him explain it on a bloody, on a TV show. Um, so if it works for Darren, not that I'm anywhere near the level of Darren, that's not what I'm saying, but he's one of the greatest, if not the greatest mentalist in the world. And that approach works for him. And I respect that approach. And from what I've found when I'm performing, if I'm saying to, pe saying to people, Oh, like I'm looking for facial cues, facial tics, expressions. It's the corners of the eyes, corners of the mouth, jawline, eyebrows. Sometimes people nod at you without even realizing they're doing it. Blah, 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 blah. And then people are looking for that. And then when they don't see it, because it's not actually happening, so they don't see it happening. And I'll go left eye. Did you see the left eye? And they'll be like, no, left eye move. And they're like, oh, my God. And that's almost more amazing because you're kind of letting them behind the curtain a little bit, or they think that you are, but then you're still doing something that they could never do. So it's still magic. It's something that they could never possibly do. But just because you're giving them that little peek behind the curtain of what they think they're getting an idea of how it works, but to then still not be able to do it, even though you've given them that little bit of an idea, it just blows people away, is what I find. I understand exactly what you're saying. And I don't, <clears throat> I never want what I to do to offend anybody else or think that I'm trying to belittle anything within magic in any way shape or form because i'm genuinely not but i just find as a performance bearing in mind i've been going out and, and trying different methods and <clears throat> trying different ways of performing 
I've been out there when I first started doing this and acted like I was really reading people's minds. But there's a lot of people out there that know that that's not possible. You can't genuinely read somebody's mind. So I found as a performer to make it more believable for me that if I figured out a way that is kind of possible, it's believable, and then you tell them about it, that kind of settles it into their head that, oh, shit, this guy actually knows what he's doing. And that, from then on, means that you can move on and do other stuff that is even less believable because you've already put it in their head that, holy crap, this guy, he knows his shit. And then you get credibility. And then because you've got that credibility, you can push the boundaries more with what you're doing because you've already sold it to them. Does that make sense? That's what I've found so far. Okay. Good answer. Really interesting. Really interesting approach to it. Really, really Thanks, interesting. Bro. Um, let's, uh, sorry, it took me so long to get through that question, Rainer. I was really interested and I didn't want to lose my train of thought, but <laughs> welcome to Netflix. Welcome to the VMC. Welcome hey, to What question have you got? Hi there. Um, you guys can hear me just to, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, yeah, I'm Ray. I'm from the, or Rainier, whatever you prefer. I'm from the Netherlands. Just a quick introduction. Um, and first time here. Thanks. So welcome. yeah, my question was, um, basically, what does your process look like? You know, you buy a trick or you read it, read up a trick somewhere. What does your process look like, like from that moment until you start to perform in somewhere? Okay, cool. Good question. Um, lots of people do this in different ways. I've spoken to lots of different magicians that learn tricks in different ways. Tom might be able to answer this as well because he learns a lot of tricks and goes out and performs a lot all the time. What I like to do is... Um, I, I sit because I am what they call a kinesthetic learner. So if I just sit and watch a video, it won't go in. I can't just watch something and learn it. That's not how my brain works. Same as I can't, if someone just sits there and tells me something, it doesn't go in. It happens all the time. And it comes across as rude sometimes because if somebody's trying to teach me something, I've got to do it. I've, I've got to physically do it. So while I, I'll get the tutorial, I'll sit and, and put the tutorial on the TV or the computer or my phone or whatever. And then I'll sit with the prop and I will, or whatever the deck of cards or whatever it is that I'm learning and go through it step by step as they're teaching it. And because I'm actually doing it, then that kind of gets in my head. So then I'll figure out the method and how it works, whatever it is that you have to do, whether it be coins or cards or bill it or whatever, figure out what it is that I've got to do. And then the way that I remember how the process works is to put some lib to it. Lib is what uh, we call the, the words that you say as you're performing it. So I'll come up with some kind of performance to go with it. And then I'll sit there and I'll go through the performance out loud, just talking through the performance while I'm doing it. And I feel like that that is the quickest way to build muscle memory. So then as I'm talking, my hand just knows what to do because I've gone through it that many times where I'm saying it and then doing it at the same time. And it just merges into one thing. Does that make sense? Depending on the trick, but. Sure. And, and during that process, so you're, you're basically living, so coming up with things to say. Yeah. Are you at any point, you know, are you critical about the things you say or is it just about getting the words down and just, you know no no constantly i'm constantly critical of everything that i ever do ever um so i'll get a rough idea of what i want to want to do and then if i get to a point where i'm happy with the lib and i'm happy with the presentation mm -hmm. then the only way to after you've got you can only go so far sitting on your own and, yeah. and doing that coming up with a presentation and, and getting the muscle memory right to go out and perform there's only so far you can go and you, at that point, I'd say you're probably 25, 30% of what the trick can be. And then the only way to progress that forward is to go and do it live, go and do it in front of people, two real paying customers. And then you just evolve it from there on out. So with what you're saying will change exponentially after the first time you've been out and performed something, what you say during the trick will change completely because you're just constantly looking for the reaction that you're getting from people and whether things are making sense to people, you've got to make sure that what you're saying 
is understandable to anybody that you're performing to. So then everything kind of evolves from that point onwards. And then it's, and then it's flight time. And then after five performances, 10 performances, 20 performances, however long it takes, um, eventually you'll get it to a point where you're happy. But the only way to do that is to do it to real people. All right. Thank you. You're very welcome. Tom, do you agree? Uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, I def yeah, I definitely agree on that. Cause, uh, but my advice is quite lazy because I, I barely learn the trick and then just have to take it out literally just get the bare bones done and then just go out to the public and just try oh, it. So you just learn it and then just go out and learn on the job. Yeah, not, not, not on the job, but I've got like a, my testing ground where my wife works. Oh, I see. Okay. It's, it's literally, I watch the tutorial. As soon as I got the tutorial, as soon as I got the little bits I need, need to know, I'm straight out and perform it to somebody because I just can't learn just sat in front of a mirror. I have to go out and do it. So I'm, I'm, it's that's bad advice. I wouldn't recommend people to do that. But yeah, that's kind of <laughs> it works amazing. for you, man. I, said, I only get it to a point where I can perform mm -hmm. it to myself. But then you're yeah. absolutely right. You can't, you can't really perform tricks to yourself. You need to be able to go out there and and perform them in the real world. Um, yeah, I try. Tom is cheating. He has a family. Yeah. Oh, it's all gone a bit. Is my thing still on? Yeah. Yeah, you're there, Matt. You're absolutely there. Oh, yeah, there. yeah, I'm still there. Sorry, dude. Oh, so Andrew Lucas has come in, and I know for a fact that he's got a couple of questions because he messaged me earlier to tell me that he had. Amazing. Well, before Andrew answers the question, Andrew, it's great to see you, my friend. I hope you're well. Um, uh, Chris has got another question. He's got his hand up. And as Chris started answering the... As, uh, as Chris was the first person to answer a sensible question, I'm going to look forward to this one. This is going to be amazing. <laughs> he might go the other way now. Matt, what's your favorite pizza topic? No. Uh, <laughs> this isn't a VI podcast. We'll move Jeez. on. So, um, uh, probably uh, in the last few weeks, um, I was listening to an Alakazam podcast. The uh, Jamie Dawes is new in the Desert Island Tricks with mm -hmm. Andy Smith was getting interviewed on there. And one of the things they talk about is books. So I don't know if you're a heavy reader, but it was funny listening to Andy Smith. If all books that he could take on a desert island, what would be the one, right? And it was Strong Magic by Darwin Ortiz. And what you and Craig were talking about kind of triggered this in my memory because uh, I had read that a couple of years ago, went back to it. Apparently, Andy reads this book literally every year because as his show is changing and um, maturing, uh, he wants to take a look at those effects from different angles. So he always goes back and kind of refreshes his years start with Ortiz and, and his strong magic. I don't know, have you ever read that book? Have you ever had the opportunity to read Darwin's no, strong magic? Because the, the reason I would love your feedback on that eventually, maybe down the road, if you get a chance to read it and then do some sort of interview or, or come back to, to do a VMC, Ortiz in there talks something about what Greg was mentioning as well is, is that uh, all if a, if a layman learns even 10% of how a trick is done, right? They don't know anything, but they may have seen you flash or something. They'll figure out that they know the trick and they've mm -hmm. lost interest in the trick because now they have it. Even though 90%, they're still dumber than a doornail when it comes to how the trick was done. Whereas a magician will watch an effect and they figured out 90%, but if they can't figure out that last move, they're all pissed off because it's still, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. So with the way that your approach to mentalism, as you get into magic, and I think the Ortiz book would help you as well, if you're transitioning also or want to get diving more into magic, it would be interesting for you to, to, to see that or read there's a couple of good pieces in there, let alone his entire thought process because the guy was like mental genius, right? Uh, but even bringing in a mentalism, uh, as I look at stuff like having watched Chris Carter and Laval and, and D. Christopher and all these guys, they, they do the mentalism. Everybody knows you can't read their mind, but they're also not going to confirm nor deny what, what they're doing. And in a way that when the audiences that I've watched them perform in front of, they love it because they know very well they can't read their mind, but how are they doing? And they don't even give them a hint. This is not manipulation. Yeah. This is not... Uh, I'm not doing anything. I'm not reading you. How did he figure that out? And it just frustrates the audience to no end. 
Uh, so it is an interesting approach that you're taking more of a Darren Brown-esque, uh, this is what I'm doing, sort of, but it's not really. Uh, yeah. But you're kind of putting them down one garden path while going completely uh, uh, an opposite direction. But it uh, that just kind of y'all's conversation, I was like, I wonder if he's ever read Ortiz and looked at it and then reevaluates that. So that would be my only thing. I It's more of a uh, suggestion than a question but uh if yeah. you if you become a heavy reader that's one of the first ones i'd suggest taking up and, and reading because the guys obviously had mad skills but his looks at magic and he's a little harsh in there too he calls out a couple of of folks that just go sorry you sucked at this and this is the way that it is so he's a little opinionated however good reading and that's that's all i would have to say but i i loved yeah. your answer earlier that was very interesting that take as well so Thanks for the time. Thank so. you. Yeah, well, I'll take a look. I mean, it's finding time to sit and read a book. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, I, I would love to. I used to read okay. a lot um, before I... working for Craig. Can I ask <laughs> uh, no, I struggle for time. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, it sounds like a really interesting book. Yeah, absolutely. it's a good one. All right, sir. Can I ask a question? I actually don't think, and this isn't a bad thing, by the way, because you've only been in magic for zip points three seconds. Yeah. I don't think you've actually ever read any magic books. No, I haven't. Not a single book. No, not that's a single bad thing. I'm not, I'm not that's saying not that's a bad thing. Because, again, we sometimes forget that Matt's journey into magic is so different to anyone else's that I've ever seen. Like, just completely so different. Like, most people will start, you know, finding something, find somewhere like Penguin Magic or Alazam, buy a load of crap. Uh, then then they'll go on the forums and the forums will tell you to buy a load of books. They'll probably buy Royal Road. They'll probably buy a 13 Steps. They'll probably buy Card College, probably buy Bobos, depending on what they're into. Maximum Entertainment will probably get suggested very early on. You'll mm -hmm. you'll look at all these classic books and then you'll find, you know, an approach. it's normally years before people even start performing to real people. Like your approach into magic, like day one, people can see it. It's documented on the Internet, you know. Day one, I taught you Jay Sankey's back in time and you were running around the streets of Cannock showing people it. Like a year and yeah. a half later, you're probably doing more gigs than most people. You performed at the Backpool Magic Convention. You know, your journey into magic is very different. And because of that, the material that you've I don't know, digested. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like you know, you, you 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 I don't think I can think of anybody who's doing the level of gigs that you're doing that hasn't read multiple books. But I'm also in a really privileged position that I'm constantly surrounded by people that have got 20, 30 years experience. So the amount of times that I've come to you and gone, oh, quite, I've seen this, I quite like the idea of this, and you're like, it's not gonna work. So, and I'll be like, why? And you'll be like, for this reason, this reason, this reason, and this reason. Or I'll go to Nem and say to Nem, oh, I've got this idea for this. Like, and he was like, no, it's not gonna work. Why? because this, 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 and this. And I'm like, okay, cool. So I don't have to, I haven't had to kind of find my own way into it. I'm surrounded by incredibly talented, professional gigging magicians that have got decades of experience under their belts that will just flat out go, that's not going to work. Do you know what I mean? And I, I haven't had to go out and learn the hard way in the real world that, oh shit, yeah, that's not going to work. I mean, I've been out and done effects that haven't worked and gone, okay, shit, yeah, that, that's not, I'm going to have to change that or change my presentation or that was my fault or whatever. And I've been out in the real world and done tricks that haven't worked, obviously, but I've also had a vast amount of like you, you and Nem and Tom and Lloyd and John Morton and Simon Lipkin, and do you know what I mean? And Luca Volpe, Peter T uh, Peter Nardi, all you guys are my books that I can just go to when I need to learn something, as opposed to having to sit and read through a book. I mean, uh, you know, and I, it doesn't pass me by; it doesn't go over my head. I'm in a very privileged position that I've got some of the best magicians in the world that I can just call if I need to and go. Is that going to work? I've got this idea. What do you think about this? Drew Perry. The amount of times I spend on the phone to Drew, just going, I've got this really weird idea that's coming to my head. Do you reckon this could work? Not like that, but it could work like this. Do you know what I mean? So 
I really wanted, I'd, I'd like reading. I'd love to be able to sit down and, and read a book, but we are that busy that I yeah. finding time to sit down and read a book this thick. It's going to take me forever when I can just call you and go, how does that work? Will this effect work? Will that go with this? Will that effect work with that effect? Oh, somebody's released this. Would that work with what I do? Do you know what I mean? And I've got people that I can just call and speak to. Mm -hmm. Sure. It makes me sound like a brat, doesn't it? But <laughs> spoiled <laughs> shut. No. Yeah, exactly. You're yeah. more of a well, your approach per Craig and him throwing you out there, right? Two years ago, it was very gladiator-esque in my eyes, is just you're gonna float or sink one way or the other, but to to go into that immediate live action with very little prep except for one tool. It's very old school. It's effective, obviously, and you've been very successful at it. Uh, so, for, you know, hats off on that. It is pretty amazing. It does remind me of, as you were talking about being surrounded by such talented magicians, that's old school Die Vernon type where they all got together and party and talked about that stuff all the time or Tamarice over in, in uh, y'all's part of the planet there. But it's just, uh, it's real blessing. Uh, and obviously you're uh, very uh, thankful for it. But uh, yeah, yeah, that just uh, well, literally, Craig there, told me you find that time, you know, uh, you know, amongst all that uh, insanity. I, <laughs> I need a holiday, and then I can go and sit by a pool and read a book. Can't I? You'll need a desert. My holiday last more. year involved me <laughs> traveling around Europe on a motorbike. I didn't have much time to read then. Um, <laughs> but yeah, Craig taught me how to do a double lift, and then three weeks later, I was performing at Smoke and Mirrors. <laughs> three weeks after being taught how to do a double lift. I walked into Smoke and Mirrors in Bristol and performed to real people. Three weeks. So I had to learn very, very quickly. And I didn't walk into Smoke and Mirrors on my own. I walked into Smoke and Mirrors with Craig Petty and Nemed Phoenix, two mm -hmm. of the best gigging magicians in the country. So it, was, it wasn't a matter of, uh, you know, I can start to learn this slowly and I can kind of build my way up and blah, blah, blah. I was walking into corporate gigs next to that guy. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And then having to hold my own against Craig Petty for paying customers. Yeah. Through the company that I worked for. If I fuck that up, that's game over for me. So it, it was a matter of I'd go to work, I'd sell some stuff for him, and then I'd go home and sit until I fell asleep, until I passed out just going over and 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 everything that I was going to have to do that weekend because I had to get to a level where I could stand against these two and mm -hmm. Tom and a, a bunch of other magicians and I was always going to be compared to these guys not by the magic community by the customers that we're going to perform to and I was always going to be I can't go Oh yeah, we're doing a YouTube documentary. I only started doing magic two weeks ago. And they'll be like, well, why are you here? Why have we just paid hundreds of pounds to, <laughs> to have you here? So my learning curve was like that. Right. And I had to, out of necessity, get to a point where I could hold my own against these guys very, very, very quickly. And yes, I'm in a very privileged position where I've got these people helping me, but they didn't do it for me. Mm -hmm. I had to work my arse off and I yeah. still am now working my arse off to stay or to try and catch up over the 30 years of experience that these guys have got over me, you know? So yes, I'm very, very privileged position, but I'm working for it. Mm -hmm. I'm guess. thankful and it's not going over my head. That I understand how lucky I am, um, but I'm working really hard to stay where I am. Very cool. Thanks, man. We got, yep. uh, we've got another question from Andreas. Andreas, you're on with Matt. Yeah, yeah, Matt. Uh, another one. Well, a couple of weeks ago, maybe months now, Craig showed you some stuff he did with memorized decks, and, and you were affected. Clubs. In, you were infected <laughs> immediately. And um, well, we 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 chatted these days, and then uh, decided on the monomic monomic memory stack. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> memory stack. Um, 
How far are you with your memorization? Four clubs. <laughs> <laughs> so one. <laughs> What's the second? <laughs> yeah, it's I genuinely it's mind blowing the mem deck, and I would absolutely love to have it, and I'm determined that I will get it. I will Same get it. here. I, I, I'm in with 15, which is still more than double the size to go. But it's... David Murphy's got it. And he keeps going on at me all the time. You, have you done it yet? Have you done it yet? Get this app. Get that app. Get blah, blah, blah. But you can get all the apps in the world. But at the end of the day, you need yeah. the time and the brain capacity to sit yeah. there and wedge it in. Yeah. So I, what I want to be able to do, I don't even think I've told Craig this yet. What I want to be able to do is... If I get to the point where I do my Magic Circle audition, I want to do something with a mem deck during the Magic Circle audition. Because if they know that, I mean, obviously they will. If they know it's a mem deck, then they'll know that that's an amount, that's like a decent amount of skill. In order to be able to do something with a mem deck, you've had to learn the mem deck, and that's quite skillful. So I'm hoping, because I know that they're looking for methods and skill, and mentalists don't really. Do you know what I mean? I mean, we can do peaks and stuff, but what they're looking for is, you know, magic is going to tick more boxes than mentalism. So I'm thinking if I do something with a mem deck, then that may give me an extra point or two. So I, before I go to the Magic Circle audition, I want to have the mem deck down. So I, I'm very much intending to do it. Yeah, let's learn. Four clubs. I've made a start. Yeah, there we go. And then I've just got a 51 to go. <laughs> two of hearts. I can give you a peak, peak lookout. You can do yeah, it. Yeah, maybe, maybe we need, to, maybe I need to buddy up with someone, and we could like help each other out or whatever. If somebody else is trying to get it as well, so yeah, I, I um, do, I do. I said I'm 15 cards in by now, so still oh, way ahead. David Murphy's been trying to help me, um, but I'm, I'm a terrible student. I'm a terrible student. Um, but yeah, David Murphy has been trying to help me, but I will get it. I will. What I'm determined to get. Tom, have you got it? Do you know the mem deck? Uh, I know 17 of Mnemonica, up to 17. That's as uh, okay. far as... Just because Two that, more that... than I do. Two more than I do. I'm just... <laughs> I, I use that for a, a a trick, but then I still have a crib because on when it comes to real world, I'm like, eh? <laughs> so gotcha. I still have... Yeah. That's what I'm worried uh, about. If I do something but, and I make it up those... in the real world, I'm like, oh, shit. But, but there, there are easygoing crips. If if you have a if you have a card shark phoenix deck, they have a crip on 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 one of their bonus cards, uh, and it comes for free. That's cheating, though, isn't it? Did somebody give you a crypt stick on the bottom of your box at Blackpool? I'm sure I remember that. Yes, somebody did actually. I can't remember who that was, but yeah, somebody came up to me at Blackpool and gave me a little sticker that looks like the black sticker that goes on the underside of a, a deck of boys a boys school deck. And it's actually the mnemonic crib, which yeah, I thought and, was genius. And card shark, card shark is also selling a clam, uh, a card box cl uh, clam that has it's got uh, it on it. Tamaris decks on the outside. That's I've card. forgotten about that, Tom. I have. A, I've got that somewhere. That's on my shelf somewhere. Yeah. I have got that. Yeah, that's really. Yeah, it's really clever. So I want to do that. I'll never forget. <laughs> I'll never forget when Ryland reviewed the Stack Watch by Pete Turner. Which is a watch designed to tell you what the new moniker stack is. I've never seen Peter turn away it. That's because he never has and never will. But uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, the day that Pete Turner starts wearing a stack watch is the day that is the day that James Keatley, uh, sorry Eric Jones, starts wearing a uh, uh, a black ops watch. It's just never going to happen. I want the jumbo <laughs> version. I don't know who did that, but I seen it in Blackpool once. It was, uh, yeah, it was uh, it was Mark. Uh, Mark, what's his face? Mark Lemon, Mark Lemon. But uh, I'll never forget when Ryan reviewed oh, the stack Lemon. watch and told everybody over the internet that it was the worst trick in the entire world. Um, and I was, I was like, well, what do you say to these magicians that are struggling to memorize the uh, the 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 mnemonic? And you just said, try harder. And I went, wouldn't you advise getting a crib? He was like, no, just don't be a wimp. So, in the um, in in the words of Ryan, don't be a wimp and just try harder. Yeah, just just do it, just do it. But, but, but some, the... some people naturally have have an issue with memorizing things, regardless yeah, of the back or memory is like a sponge. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so true. Anyway, we've got a question from Tom, and then Andrew's come on. He was on before, but now he's here uh, with this happy smiley face, which is always good to see. Um, but first of all, Tom did have his hand up first. 
So we're going to get Sensible Tom and we're going to get Bizarre Tom. We will find out. I've got two questions. I've got two questions. The first one, is the earth flat or round? Here we go. <laughs> Technically, neither. It's a globe. So it's a okay. ball. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, well, that's... Yeah, okay. We'll go with that. Um... Do you have a sensible <laughs> question? <laughs> <laughs> no, my que- no, my que- my question is, uh, you um, you perform on stage, you work in the office, uh, you train in Ireland, you do your acting, you there's so much stuff you do, so much stuff to do. Has there been a point because it's happened to me before? Has there been a point, or are you scared that you're just going to break down and it's just every gonna... day? Has it happened? And if if um... it has happened, what brought you back? Depends on what you mean by breakdown. Um, like, I'll stuff all this. I just want to work in the office and I just want oh, to no. ride my bike. I've never had the point where I'm just like, I just want to work in the office. Definitely. I love performing. Performing's my life. That's that's who I am. It's what I do. Yeah. Um, if I wasn't performing something, like a, a long time ago, um, I got to that point with my band. We were touring a lot um, all over the country. And I was the only one that did anything. I had four other lads in the band with me, but I did all of the social media. I did all of the dealing with the agents. I did all of the dealing with the venues and the sound techs and the promoters and the merch people and designers and everything. And they literally just turned up, walked out on stage, did the show and then disappeared. And I was running my butt into the ground trying to keep this band going. And it did get to the point where I just went, done, I'm done. Like I can't, I can't do this anymore, I'm done. And then I just stopped doing all of the other stuff. I wasn't answering emails. I wasn't returning phone calls. I wasn't, I was literally just doing the gigs that we've already got booked. Um, And I ran those gigs out. And as soon as we'd done the gigs that we already had booked, I was like, I'm done boys. Like that's it, I've had enough. I can't do this anymore. And they're like, you can't leave. And I'm like, why? And they're like, because you're the singer of the band. And I'm like, yeah, we haven't got any gigs booked. There's nothing. There's nothing in the diary. We have no gigs booked at all. Um, and they were like, why? And I'm like, exactly. <laughs> you should know that. You should be helping me. You should be doing this stuff. And because I haven't done anything for the last two months, we're out of gigs. And I'm done. And I walked away. Um, and then I sat at home the following day and then went to work. And then I was like, I- I've, been not- I've not been in a band for a day. And I was miserable because <laughs> I didn't know when the next time I was going to walk on stage. I was miserable to the point where the girlfriend that I was with at the time was like, just find another band for Christ's sake, for the love of God, find something else to do that involves you being on a stage. Because after like a month, I was, I, I got, I couldn't like, I was unlivable. <laughs> like I could, like I felt really bad for her because I was unbearable. Like I couldn't do it. Um, same as when I had my accident, when I had my motorbike accident a couple of years back, I was laid up in bed. I couldn't even go to the office. Um, and that was, I think after it was just after COVID had finished. So they opened the office again, Craig and Sarah called me and said, do you want to come back? And I was like, fuck yes, thank you. Go went back to the office. Um, and then that was on, I think I went back to the office on the Monday. And then the following Tuesday, I was in, I had my motorbike accident. So I'd only been back in the office for a week after two years of not being able to leave the house. And then I was in a hospital bed, <laughs> not being able to move or do anything. Um, and then I was laid up for weeks, couldn't move. Um, and I was borderline suicidal. I couldn't, I just can't do it. I can't not be out performing. It's part of my DNA. It's who I am. So at no point have I ever gone, that's it, I'm done performing, I'm never going to perform again. Absolutely not. It gets to well, points... At the beginning times... of January this year, you were pretty broken. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, 100%. Of gigs obviously. that you'd done over December. Yeah. And then you were st- you'd been filming the match of entry since November, so you'd been rehearsing yeah. all of the stuff for the Bear Pit. Then you had the November and December from hell with the amount of gigs. And then yeah. I remember when January hit, we had three illusion shows in the first week. And yeah. you were just like, <laughs> and then and then you were back in work, and you were just, you looked broken. Yeah, we both did. We we both got to the point where we were like, our, our minds are like 
I love gigging. I love being on stage. I love doing this. But our bodies were just like, you're fucking idiots. You need to stop. And people like that I know, like family and friends that I, you know, saw over Christmas on the four days I had off over the entire Christmas period, like I saw friends and stuff and they just look at me and just be like, what, look, you need to start looking after yourself. You look terrible. And I'm like, I am looking after myself. I'm just, I'm working like a lot. Um, so yeah, it do, you do, I think it's important. Like if I ever get to a point where mentally I'm just shutting down, the only thing that really kind of helps, which is really awkward over Christmas because the, the weather's terrible, is going for a ride on my bike. So if I, as soon as I put my helmet on and I sit on my motorbike and within two minutes, of riding down the drive and riding down the road it just my brain just starts to and it's just me and the road and even if i'm out with groups of people you're still in your own little bubble it's me and my bike i love my bike more than anything in the world it's me and my bike and we're just out on the road and it's it's like therapy for me it really is and going out on my bike for a, a day makes such a massive difference to my mental health it just pulls me back in and i think it's Matt, really what important. kind of bike do you have i have a um i have four actually but the one that i ride the most is a kawasaki z900 abs it's the naked bike nice. it's beautiful um her name's henata <laughs> um which means chasing the sun in japanese um it's actually printed on the side a sticker made and it's printed on the side of the fairings um but yeah i think it's important for and this is the same with lots of people that i know that are professional performers not just magicians but a anything um it's important to have something that you can go and do that that takes you away from the stresses of day to day and me and my cousin talk about this all the time my cousin's a biker he's the one that got him and my dad were the ones that got me into biking. My cousin's 10 years older than I am. Um, he's the one that I rode around, uh, rode around Europe with. And we have this conversation quite often where when we can't get out on our bikes during winter because the weather's so bad, it genuinely it affects your mental health. So we went out uh, last week, one of, the, uh, one of the weekend days last Sunday. Um, and by the end of the day, we were both different people because it just it resets your brain. So I think it's really important. We got it did. I mean, not saying ride a motorbike, but for anyone that works as hard as as we work at the company, to have something that kind of relaxes you and 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 resets your brain is really really important. That that's great because uh, you know uh, I almost like it all became too much just life and everything just became too much and yeah that that's good advice so you know it's you need to be able to switch off uh, but I might but yeah. yeah well we've spoke about it haven't we i'm tempted, yeah. I'm tempted. and you're yeah. from matlock which is one of the biking meccas in the midlands so yeah it's the perfect place to to be a biker living in matlock because even if you could literally like the amount of times that we get up of a sunday morning in the summer ride to matlock and then we'll just sit at matlock for the day just talking to yeah. all the other bikers and looking at all the other bikes and just being a part of that community of bikers is massive. You can, it's the same as being a magician at a convention. Yeah. You can walk and talk to anyone. If they're in bike yeah. leathers, you can go and talk to them. Yeah. Um, it's the same as being a magician. Like you just in, you're in that club, you're part of yeah. that world. Um, and sitting in, I've sat at Matlock for an entire day and eaten chip shop twice. Cause we've been there that long. Do you know what I mean? It's, um, yeah. And it helps. It helps. It helps your brain, man. Like it, it helps. Just find something. Not necessarily bikes, but find something that you can do that mm. kind of that that resets your brain. Mm. If all else fails, just call me. You can come out on the back of my bike. Yeah, <laughs> I'd love to go on the back of your bike. In you can come on the back of my bike whenever you want, dude. <laughs> no, great answer. Thanks for that. Cause yeah, yeah, that's cool. No cool answer. Right. It has come to that time where we get to hear from the always awesome Andrew Lucas. Andrew, I hope you're well, my friend. I haven't seen you on a VMC for a while. I hope you are good. Andrew, that's the bit where you talk. Are you away? I am. I'm there. Hang on a second. I'm just okay. trying to press the right. I'm just trying to press the right buttons, and I lost it. I'm on my phone. So there we go. There you go. There we go. Okay. There we go. Yeah, I'm good. Thank you. Yeah, how's how's you, how's everybody anyway? Good. 
All yeah. good, man. All Plenty good. Plenty of thumbs. I think everyone's good. So I've got, I got three. I got three questions actually. So I've got an extra one on the one that I already, the two I'd already uh, mentioned to Matt, just in case. By the way, thank you very much for keeping the questions going whilst I drove back from my meeting that I had, which was why I wasn't able to join from the beginning and stuff like that. And I was terribly worried that I wouldn't get, I wouldn't get back in time. But you managed to keep the questions going. So my half hour <laughs> journey, my half hour journey back on the M6 was uh, was much more entertaining than normal. So um, you missed so out. My some questions. You missed well, out. Some I shall. I'll look forward to catching up on the on what I've missed when uh, when we get to it. Anyway, so um, uh, first question actually is to both um, to Matt and to Craig, really. But it, I know this is a Q and A for Matt, but uh, I'm just saying this one because I'll forget this one because I've just thought of it. But when I I was involved in music for uh, twenty years and I ran a music festival, and what I found when I did that was I kind of got into that because I loved music and um, I just was really passionate about kind of communicating it and uh, and and getting other people to see what I saw about it and, and everything. But during the course of it, um, being involved in it professionally, I kind of lost a little bit of the passion uh, that I had at the start because um, I would kind of go to a music event and I'd look at it and I'd go, well, why the hell have they done that? And, you know, well, that's just stupid. And 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 I'd kind of analyse it a, a lot. And I lost a little bit of the passion about it. So my question is, um, how do you, do you still feel as passion? Do you still feel that uh, passion that you had at the beginning? And if so, how have you kept, you know, how have you kind of kept that passion going? Craig, do you want to get that? I can. Oh, hang on. Yeah, I can do. I mean, um, do you want to go first or do you want me to? Hang on. I can me... go first if you want. Yeah. Well, I, it's all about you. I'll answer the question as well. But, you know, let me go after you because I'm more important. So you go first. Uh, um, as far as, like, keeping the passion, I mean, I think that's one of the reasons why I do so many varied different things because i love performing regardless but then i i do music and i do acting uh with the musical the murder mystery company i do musical theater I, now i do magic and that's a whole I bunch heard, of by stuff. the way sorry just want to interrupt i heard that you still occasionally still practice the moves to various different take that songs please continue well wherever you heard that that was a lie I'm way too old and nowhere near as nimble now to be able to do that. Um, I saw you in the staff room the other day. It would it would just be embarrassing if I tried to do that now. So um, I don't do that. But thank you for <coughs> putting in. We, um, <laughs> so I, yeah, because I do so many very different things, I think that helps with keeping the, the passion for it alive because there's always something new and even with magic i found that you know a close-up gig is completely different to a cabaret show which is completely different to a stage show which is completely different to doing a stage show with craig mm. which is completely different to doing stage show with Wyland and craig which is completely different to doing a stage show with nem and it's completely different to doing a close-up gig with tom and do you know what i mean so, and there's always new stuff that we're learning there's always new illusions we're putting in the show there's always new magic to learn um and it's the same with with music there's always new songs to write and then there's finding out how they're like walking onto a stage and performing a song for the first time is exhilarating because you don't know how it's going to go down. And the band that I was in was an originals band. So it was my own thoughts and feelings and our own music that we'd written. So finding out how that was coming back from the audience was always really interesting. Um, murder Mysteries, every single time we do a Murder Mystery is a completely different show. You can't do the same Murder Mystery twice because if somebody comes to see you again, it can't be the same murderer with the same motive because they'll have already seen it once. Do you know what I mean? So every single time we do a murder mystery, and most of them are between two and a half and three hours long. So every single time we, learn, we do a murder mystery, it's like learning every single word to a movie every time we do a murder mystery. Um, and it's completely different every time. And it's different cast members every time. And when we do musical theatre, we had various different cast members and we were performing at different theatres around the country and different audiences and it's kind of as a performer I understand what you're saying with um I used to put on gigs there was a place called the Roadhouse in Birmingham I worked there for a long time doing various different shows and putting festivals on there and stuff um 
and doing that is literally just dealing with magician uh, with musicians and most musicians are bellends so it's kind of trying to deal with musicians constantly um and putting on these shows and having the same issues every time that did get monotonous so i totally understand where you're coming from as a um a promoter and a as a, a festival organizer but as a performer i mm. try to do many 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 different types of performance which keeps everything fresh so i never get bored of performing i get bored of sitting in the office sometimes but i never get bored of performing <laughs> Great. How about you, Craig? That's a very good answer. Uh, uh, basically, what he <laughs> said. Um, <laughs> no. um, yeah, it's true. Uh, bye, Rena. Take care, buddy. Uh, See you, buddy. So, um, yeah, I um, if I do the same thing over and over again, I get really bored. Um, so, you know, I've had this conversation before with people, but. Uh, there's a lot of um excuse me magicians that'll do the same five or six tricks the fa same five or six concert tricks every single gig they won't change them around they'll just do those same five or six tricks every single time there's kids magicians that'll do the same five or six trick kids tricks every single time um there's 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 uh, people that will do the same stage show every single time i i my king do... does... <laughs> how long has he done that exactly. but i i do magic because you know, I'm in a very uh, kind of lucky position, an enviable position in the, I mean, Matt will tell you, I don't need to perform ever again if I don't want to. If I wanted to just stay in the office, it wouldn't make any bearing. I mean, it, when I go out and do a gig, it's not like I'm getting paid for it. I'm not. I don't get a penny from going out and doing a gig. It just goes into the company, whether the, whether I go and do the gig or not, it makes absolutely no bearing. Um, I perform because I love doing it. And I'll turn around to Sarah and say, the day that I stop performing or the day I stop wanting to perform is the day that this oh. company shut down. Um, so I, I maintain interest by doing the stuff I enjoy doing. Uh, I go out and I, I, I do kids gigs, you know, it's like um, people go, Oh, why are you still doing kids gigs? Because I love doing kids gigs. I love performing for children. Um, I think they're a very honest audience. I'll go out and I'll do oh. stage shows. Do illusion shows. I'll go work at Smoke and Mirrors, and I'll be very, you know, sweary and 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 that style of comedy. And the next day, I'll be working at a wedding. Then I'll do a close-up job. Um, it's why I'm constantly creating magic. I'm constantly creating magic because it forces me to work it in. So it's the best it can be. It forces me to go out and perform new stuff every single time. Um, and it's one of the reasons I like working with people. You know, I like work. At, why do I do the gold membership of the Netflix? I like working with people. I like seeing them improve. I like helping them get better. You know, people, um, you know, watching Tom is a perfect example, you know, going from um, not having a clue what he's doing to being, you know, mildly competent. I mean, uh, over the course of the last year, I mean, it's just wonderful <laughs> to see that. Um, it's, it's a better compliment it, than I've ever had, mate. So take it. It's watching watching Matt. I mean, but anybody who knows me knows that probably my my biggest source of inspiration these days is Ryland. I would literally drop anything to go and do a gig with him. Like I would drop anything. Oh. Like I put my life on hold for America's Got Talent for weeks. So did Matt. Nah. I put, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I put my life on hold for Britain's Got Talent. You know, he's doing this tour with Killian. I've put my life on hold. When a gig comes up and somebody wants Ryland, if I'm on a gig, that gig gets taken off me. I'd I'd rather go and tech a show with Ryland and chaperone him to do a gig than than do any gig myself because I get a chance to um watch him grow and watch him develop and it's lovely that he's got a style of magic that's very very different to me he likes doing magic to music he's influenced more by you know Matt and choreography and you know doing magic to music than he is the sort of magic that I do and that is great so you know, it's, it's, he's the one that kind of keeps me alive. And if I ever start thinking, oh, God, I'm sick of magic, I'll come home and he'll be like shoving a pack of cards in my face or a cube in my face and going, hey, I've just come up with a new cube move. Have a look at this. What do you think of this? What do you think of that? What do you think of the other? It's very hard not to be motivated when you've got something like that around you 24-7. Oh. And the other thing is I am around magic 24-7. I wake up in the morning. I've got Ryland showing me tricks. I've got Sarah talking to me about magic because that's what we do. We run magic companies. Then I go to the office. 
um, in the, 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 like the, the, the something's happening with magic all day, every day. I'm filming videos. I'm um, selling uh, selling magic. I'm creating magic. I'm on the phone to production companies, whatever. Then I'm performing in the evening, or I'm filming more videos. I'm just around magic all the time, and you know I love it. But it's never the same thing. You know, it's always different. And that's what I love about what I do. I don't know how people can just do the same thing over and over again. I, I like doing different stuff. Well, mm. no, that's, that's a good it's a good answer. I I I I agree with it really. I suppose it's what kind of I, there's a lot of that that I've seen seen how I kind of come about things, how how I've come back to magic and stuff like that as well, actually. It has been about trying to find that. Uh so I can understand that. Um by the way, uh, both of you got a parcel on it on on finally on its way to you. Um, so, uh, but you've got to make sure that you follow the instructions provided within the packaging. That's all I'm saying. Anyway, but, so okay. you'll find out. You'll find out. You'll find out what it is when you get it. Anyway, um, if it's ticking, I'm not opening it. <laughs> Flashlight. <laughs> So, second question then. Uh, second question is to Matt: uh, um, uh, Exercises that you do, do you do any exercises before you go on stage? Um, and if so, uh, you know it might be to either kind of relax you or to prepare your voice or anything like that. Do you ever do you ever do any of that kind of stuff before you go on stage? Yeah, of course. Um, I'm a singer, so vocal warm ups are a massive thing. Um, very often when we're on the way to gigs, uh, especially when I'm with Cat. Because I'm currently uh, teach cat really because <laughs> to keep myself awake when we're driving the van back from gigs and stuff, we'll put uh, songs on and I'll sing. And cat's like, I just I really want you to teach me how to sing. So I've been teaching cat how to sing, and part of being able to sing is um, doing vocal warm ups. So we have to do vocal warm ups every time. So when we get in the van on the way to gigs, or if I'm in the car on my own going to gigs, I'll do my vocal warm ups that I've been doing for years. Um, because that it keeps you, you, you know, you pre, if you're at a gig, whether it's a close up gig or a stage gig, um, a lot of the time you have to project more at close up gigs because you're not mic'd for a start. And if it's a room with 300 people in it and you're trying to speak to 20 people sitting around a table, you've got to be able to project so that everyone on that table can hear you. Um, yeah. And vocal warm ups really, really help with that. So I do the same vocal warm ups that I've done for the last two decades. Um, Which are what? To be able to get, say again? Which are what? Oh, so um, <laughs> okay. So there's um, the the first one you do is is your breathing. So you when you're a singer, you have to learn to breathe with your diaphragm. So when you breathe in, normally, you kind of shoulders come up and your lungs pop out. And but when you breathe in, as a singer, you breathe into your diaphragm. So your shoulders don't move at all. If your shoulders move when you breathe in, you're doing it wrong. Um, and then you hold that for four, breathe out for four, hold for four, breathe in for four, hold for four, breathe out for four, blah, 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 blah. And then there's a, a hum that you do. Mm, when if you're doing it right and you, your lips feel like they're vibrating. So you do that for four and then you go up your scales. Mm, you know, and, you, and then there's and then you yeah, open yeah. your mouth and do the same thing. And then because I was a screamer in my in one of the metal bands that I was in, I used to scream. I sing and scream, but I used to scream. So there's a lot of, yeah. Oh, which is one that I do that and just close and then open and close and open and close because that trains the back part of your, your throat that you used to scream, which is a different part of your throat that you used to sing. So I train that as well because when I'm projecting, that's the part of the back of my, my throat that I use. Um, so I do, and, and then you just go through a couple of songs that you know really, really well and, and sing those out and, and it just basically warms your voice up. Um, and then there's one thing that I've been teaching to Ryland, which is a musical theatre thing. Uh, so you do some warm ups and stuff like you can do any warm ups you want, physical warm up stretches, whatever. Um, and then you just you just have to get loose. So whenever Ryland's going on stage, we'll stand there. He does it himself now mm. without even being asked to do it. And he'll stand there and you shake your body out and you get your hands all loose and you get your body all loose. And I'll just go to him loosey goosey. And as soon as I say to Ryland, Lucy Goosey, he's like, oh, right, okay, yeah, cool. And he's like shaking himself out and jumping up and down. He just gets the blood pumping around your body. And if you're feeling tired and you're feeling a little bit run down, you can't walk into a gig or walk onto a stage feeling like that. So if you just stand, bolt upright, just bounce up and down on your toes. So you're just bouncing up and down a little bit on your toes. And then you shake your shoulders out, shake your wrists out and just get your body loose. 
and you, you move your head and 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 you're doing all of this and and just shaking yourself out and you just get the blood pumping around your body um and then you automatically feel more energized before you walk onto the stage so at a bare minimum i would do my vocal warm-ups and then just shake myself out and have you done that with craig in the uh, in the band as well craig will not do it craig does not do warm-ups he refuses to do oh, warm-ups he, he exactly <laughs> he will not do anything that involves any kind of preparation for any kind of show um so no chris does uh, craig does not do that no absolutely not <laughs> okay so then the final oh. one is um by the way I'm, I'm very pleased to be the honorary ellie of the uh, bmc and um, ask three questions in one go and stuff like that but <laughs> you're fine crack on um uh so the um uh, the last one uh, was um in terms of like uh, learning stagecraft and stuff like that is there any is there anything that you can do to uh, rehearse and every uh, and that at home in advance of your performances have you got any kind of techniques for kind of uh, I mean, a lot of a lot of stagecraft, I imagine, is learned by in, in the same way as you do with the magic. In the sense, you 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 go out, you do it, you try it, you kind of get the feedback and and whatever. But yeah, are the things that you can do to kind of improve your stagecraft in uh, and everything at home? Yes, of course. But you need to know the the problem is with it. Like we we have with Ryland, he the reason one of the reasons that we started working with Ryland, or I started working with Ryland, is because um, Craig doesn't do any kind of choreography and he's never had any kind of training as opposed to as when it comes to being on a stage. Craig, he has his very much his own kind of style and Craig on a stage is like an anomaly. Like you don't, that's not how you walk onto a stage. That's not how you act on a stage. But Craig has made it work for the last 30 years and he's fucking brilliant at it. But there's no kind of learnt method there he's just kind of done it on his own and learnt on his own as as you go but Ryland hasn't really got that kind of privilege because he's put on two stages that are huge and he's put on into situations and he's worked really hard to get himself into situations and as does Craig and everybody else that you to walk onto a stage at AGT you have to be able to dominate that stage and own that stage. And he's 11. He's not even five foot tall. So you can't walk out onto that stage and not look like you know what you're doing. So it was a matter of we've, we've got to get him to a point where he can walk out onto a stage and, and own that stage. And one of the main reasons that I started working with him is because he used to stand on stage whenever he was performing. He'd stand on stage and do this. So he, his hands would be here and he'd just be doing this. And then I said to him one day, why are you doing that with your hands? And his answer was, I don't know what else to do them. And it's like, okay, right, cool. So because he didn't know what to do, he just used to stand on stage like that. And the second I said to him, right, take your hands from there and put them here. And the second I told him to drop his, drop his hands, pull his shoulders back a little bit and lift his chin up, his whole demeanor changed. And it's little things like that that you pick up along the way. So you can practice all of these things at home, but you can't practice things unless you know what to do. Does that make sense? It so does. if you, the best way to do it would be to find somebody that has a lot of stage experience and get them to give you some tips on how to stand, where to put your body, what to do with your hands, how to project, how to walk. Walking across a stage, me and Tom had this conversation the other day, walking across a stage is very different to walking across a street. You walk in a very different way. When you're on a stage, the movements that you make have to be seen by the person at the back of the room. So everything is elevated, everything is more dramatic. So any kind of slight, if you're an actor and you're on a TV show and you, the, the idea is that when you have to act as natural as possible because the camera picks everything up. So you have to downplay stuff to make it look like you're not acting. On a theatre stage, it's the exact opposite. You have to go bigger. You have to make your facial expressions bigger. If you are trying to point at something, you can't just point on a theater stage you have to point because otherwise the people at the back aren't going to see what you're doing 
So, and there's only kind of working with choreographers, working with directors, producers, with acting coaches, with whatever, that you're going to be able to, to know what these things are. But as soon as you know someone, like if anybody needs any help, I'll happily, if anybody's planning on walking out on a stage and they want help, just ask me. I'll happily, like, if you send me a video of this is what I'm planning on doing, I can be like, right, that's great, but let's do this, 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 perform, uh, record it again and see if you can see the difference. And this is kind of what we did with Ireland from the get-go. I'd be like, you're doing great, mate. You're doing really well. But if you said this like this or you stood like this when you're saying it, the difference it makes is unbelievable. And it just elevates your performance so there's a million different things that you can do at home to practice you just need to know what those are and we haven't got anywhere near enough time now to go through that but there are there are definitely things that you can do at home to practice for when you get out there in the real world yes i'll definitely take you up on that offer uh, matey at some point but yeah thank you <laughs> that's brilliant <laughs> thank you no worries dude no worries at all great question as well though Really, really great question. Yeah, those questions are absolutely awesome. Really, really good. Um, so Andreas, you're back on with Matt. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Andrew, for these great questions. I, I, I they were great questions. Mine are just half as as brilliant, but well, knowing that you knew about this to happen for quite some time, let it be a couple of days or even weeks. And knowing that you are very diligent when preparing for stuff, whatever you do, I must assume that you've prepared for this Q&A as well and that you will be pissed if no one would ask you to perform. Oh, God, I'm not performing. So please, <laughs> show us your best over the that's Zoom not what this, trick. Nobody told me that's what this is about. This is about asking questions and giving answers. This isn't about performing. Well, 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 you knew that you are coming up to a BMC in, in, in front of a bunch of magicians desperately looking for you to flush out, so. <laughs> My die's not charged. <laughs> Anything. But thanks for putting me on the spot like that. I appreciate it. The thing is, he's not joking when he says his die's not charged. That's the die isn't charged. That. And I lost my die, so I've been using Tom's. Because <laughs> I've lost my emergency. But I have bought another one. Which turned up the other day. Is that the new one? Oh, no, that's the new one. That's still in the cellophane. You can nice. you can get just the die, can you not? I thought you could get a replacement die. Yes, you can get good. a replacement die, but I lost the thumper as well. Ah, ah. I'll put Bigger it back problem. in my close-up case after a gig with all of my other stuff. So everything that I take out of my close-up case has its own space in the close-up case. So then I put everything back away where it should be, and then when I got home, I opened my case and it, it, the die and the thumper both weren't there, and I'm like. That's really weird. So they both just disappeared. Um, and I've checked all my pockets, uh, like in the suit jacket that I had on and the jeans that I had on. Um, I checked in the car, uh, everywhere. I don't I don't understand where it could have possibly gone because I'm quite you, have, have putting you, everything you, back you, where it should be. Huh? Have, you checked Craig, have you checked Craig's pockets? Because he's like a budding mentalist now these days, isn't he? So it's probably in Craig's, Craig's pockets. absolutely no use whatsoever for an Androidy die. None at all. <laughs> and I've yeah, still got the charger, that, so we wouldn't be able to are... use the die, even if he'd had it, because I've still got the charger for the die. You are a little bit evasive, so... If, oh, no, um... <laughs> you have to have something prepared. I genuinely haven't got anything prepared. I, I promise you, I've got nothing prepared. Unbelievable. I wasn't expecting. In fact, actually, no. Andreas, put your hands You have to I'm return, joking. right? <laughs> you have I to can, return. I can't even do an arm thing because I can't touch you. Yeah. You the, the, put your the fingers arcing. together. How did you. Uh, the, 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 the thing that you did before the candle stuff with putting putting your leg up behind your knee and, and, yeah. and wiggling around. Is that really working? Is 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 
so, so so this is a behavioral thing this is not the magic trick is it so it's um there's a method to it but i've been doing that at close-up gigs a lot recently um and it's really affecting people like it genuinely kind of takes people back there was a, a young guy and i was uh, the gig that i did with nemed last weekend massive gig uh 33 tables with 10 to 12 people on each table <laughs> there's a lot of people at that gig and um i was there there was a it was black tie and there was a, a, a middle-aged couple and then a younger couple this guy must have been like mid-20s with his absolutely drop dead gorgeous girlfriend and this guy would he looked like a model he was like really really good looking guy super confident like what he had he's Yeah. penguin suit on with his yellow braces and his shiny shoes and um i was doing some bits with the the uh, must have been like a mom or dad or whatever that was there and then i looked at him and i was like do you want to try something a bit different and he went go on then. i was like okay just come over to me stand in front of me um i'm just going to try something using just a bit of suggestion like it doesn't like it's not going to affect you like in any way but just We're just going to try and suggest something to you. And he's like, okay. So I put your arms out to the side. He did that, blah, blah, blah. And I put my fingers on his arm and, and pushed down. And he was like big, like big muscly guy. And I'm just like put, um, trying to push him down. And I pushed him over. And I'm like, it's not a feat of strength. It's natural human body. Everybody would do that. And he's like, okay. And then I went through my patter with him, with my hand on his shoulder, and do the kind of patter that I've been working on, um, which is about uh what we're going to do is we're going to give you some more strength and, and every time i say it, like strength or you're all going to stand or you're you're not going to fall you're going to stand up and i'll like tap them on the shoulder every time i say like a like a trigger word and then i was like right drop your arms back down to your side stop me dead in the eye lift them up slowly close your fists lift your foot up behind your knee and we're going to try it again and i put my just pressed on his on his arm and he didn't go anywhere and then put my arm, my hand around his bicep and just put all my weight on him. And he could take, he was like a, a strong guy. And I, I was pulling down on his arm and he wasn't going anywhere. And then he dropped his, uh, I told him to drop his hand, step down, down by his side and blah, blah. And I was like, you okay? And he just went, yeah, I think, I think so. And I was like, you sure? And he's like, it's quite an experience, isn't it? That? And I was just like, yeah, it's cool, isn't it? And, he, and he, he kind of proper took him back. He didn't really know what to make of it. And he went from being this super confident guy to just looking at me like, am I, am I going to be okay? <laughs> just took all of the confidence out of him. It was really bizarre. What, what is the background? Why, why you, well, you shake and, and well, lose your sense of, of wake in the first place and then in the second you don't? Is yeah, it... so you just push him over the first time around and then the second time yeah i mean I, i don't craig am i allowed to give away the method well we are we are... You can give away anything you want I'm, i don't <laughs> want to it's david peace was the one that told me but i don't i don't think it's david peace's trick fine go for it because it's just an old circus thing isn't it it's like an old it's not a i don't think it's been old released time, by it's anybody it's, it's older than time began it's fine Yeah, okay, right. So, yeah, so you basically, when you have their arm, so when you are the first time round, you pick the same spot and you just push away slightly. So you okay. push away from them. And because you're pushing away from them, ever so slightly, don't make it obvious. That but when you're doing this, if you just push down and away a little bit, they're going to fall. The next time, if you push down and towards the center of their body, you can do it on your arm. Now, if you put your arm out, put your fingers on top, And then just push down and away slightly, your arm will move away. If you then just ever so slightly push towards yourself, solid as a rock, you don't go anywhere. And that's all it is. It's just a little bit of difference. Instead of going away slightly, you just go straight down or towards the body slightly, and then they don't fall over. But if you okay. sell it properly, if you've got the right patter and you sell it as suggestion and, and you say the right things at the right times, it freaks the hell out of people. Yeah, I'm so glad that you did not get me to come up and uh, uh, when you did the, the bear pit thing, maybe <laughs> honestly, my sense of balance is so shit. 
<laughs> yeah, I would have, I would have, fall, <laughs> I would have fallen over. Whatever, I was. That is the thing. Yeah, one of the bear pit, uh, one of the bear pit um, presentations that I did out of the four. One of the guys that I got up couldn't stand on one leg. He couldn't do it. Every time he lifted his one foot off the floor, he'd just fall over. So I had to I had to hold him on his shoulder, the opposite shoulder, and just hold him up just so he didn't fall over and then push down with the other arm and let him go as I was pushed just to steady him because he couldn't stand on one leg. Um, I did have to do that in one of the performances. But you can do that. You can just literally just rest your 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 fingers like over the, the opposite shoulder and hold them in place but it's not it's not ideal but it is a workaround yeah look, look out for greg rostami's angel number that's a trick okay. that's that's meant and works over zoom it's not only for zoom you can use oh, wow. it the mentalist trick and you can use it anywhere it's immediately usable by you if you are asked for doing something and it works perfectly over zoom you could have told me that before this call couldn't you and then i'd have learned it and then i'd have had something for when you asked me to perform yeah next time next time setting me up to fail dude <laughs> right next question and asking a question for the first time today we have vincent vincent how you doing man it's good to see you Hey guys, uh, sorry I can't turn the camera on. I'm at work, um, and I apologize if this was asked. Work. Yeah, uh, brilliant. I love the dedication, dude. Uh, I apologize if this was asked before I got on the call. But did you ever figure out what happened with Bain? What went wrong? <laughs> no, um, no. And believe me, I've racked my brain trying to figure out what the hell happened. Um, but no, no, it was I think just... he, I think, I did, I think the spectator swapped some, I don't know the, I don't know the trick, so I, 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 I thought that the spectator may have, uh, changed Tom things or exactly the same thing to me, because that apparently happened to him, where the spectator just swapped them, uh, but I, I don't know, I, I genuinely don't know, mm. uh, Craig was backstage and he said that he could see and the guy didn't, so, okay. but I, I don't, I don't know, um, but it's yeah. To this day, it, it gives me nightmares. Like it genuinely does. I lose. I lost a lot of sleep over that. Um, because I'm I'm taking full responsibility for it. I I was the one that was on stage. I was the one that was up there performing. I did a couple. I did numerous things wrong. I picked the wrong guy. Um, when I re I realized that he wasn't going to be a great spectator. I tried to manage it the best that I could. Um, but I was so nervous at that point anyway, and I was performing in front of a people, bunch of people that I know, which is the worst, my worst nightmare. I would much rather perform to 10,000 people that I don't know than 50 people that I do. Um, I was super nervous, and I should have, after doing Hook, I should have sent the guy back to his seat and picked somebody else. I didn't. That's on me. I was the one that set the trick up, so obviously something's gone wrong somewhere. Um bad audience management on my part i don't know and then i just had to scramble and get out of it the best way that i could but i mean i i take full responsibility for it, it was it was my fault and it was a massive learning experience and it was something that i'm hoping will never happen again um but yeah but i genuinely i don't i, I don't know how we went wrong have you performed in the circum since then? Sorry. have i performed it since yeah no no, I haven't. Because and it's not because I'm scared to do it. It's because um I got imposter by John Morton. And for me, I the way that I I think Bane visually on stage looks amazing with the uh, the cocktail shakers and stuff. I think visually it's much better, but I think that imposter I I've got a better reaction from that than I did from performing Bane because I've performed it a couple of times before it went wrong. Um, and I think that I I get a better reaction. I feel more comfortable doing Imposter and I feel like the routine that I've got for that is more my style. The only thing that I didn't really like about, um, about Bane is that you're trying to find the you're not finding the murderer 
you're finding the victim, which is kind of backwards. So when I do it as I kind of introduced it as I do murder mysteries or I worked for the police doing this, and it's all about finding the criminal, whereas Bane is about finding the victim, not the, the criminal, which is backwards for me. So I think the, the routine that I put together with imposter makes more sense because you're trying to find the criminal. And I think in my head, that works better for me. So that's why I've been doing imposter since. Um, so no, I haven't done Bane. It was a really long answer to that question. I do apologize, but no, I haven't done Bane since. I, I thought you covered it up as in the circumstances. I thought you covered it up as, as best as you could, uh, Matt, really. But uh, but actually, it, it kind of prompts a, prompts a little thing uh, to Craig, really, which is I, I, I think it would be a fantastic um, thing on uh, Netflix actually to do because I think one of the biggest things the reasons why people are fearful about going out and performing is that they don't know what to do when things go wrong um, yeah. and actually uh, a, a, a kind of um, course on what to do when 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 shit happens um, I think would be a really good uh, really good course actually yeah, well, yeah, I agree. Um, I think yeah. a lot of what happens when things go wrong is based on experience and being yeah. able to scramble. Um, I think there's three things to it. I think you're right. I think there's an element of experience. I think there's an element of preparation. I know you say that I'm not prepared when I go on stage, but because I've done so many routines on stage. Cats that's not cats. what I mean when yeah. I say prepared. What I mean I is pre-show preparation, not Kat's got this funny thing. So Kat's the assistant in the Illusion Show, and she's been my assistant now for about 12 years. And she works with everybody. She works with Matt. She works with Nemed. She works with uh, every single person that's in Slightly Unusual she works with. And she's fucking amazing. And she's she, openly says, she openly says the only person that she's completely, truly never nervous about when she goes on stage with is me, just because... She's seen so much shit go wrong in that illusion show over the last 12 years. And she, she's always just said to me, every time something's gone wrong, I know that if you're on stage, you'll figure out a way around it and nobody will even know. And and it, that's that just comes from preparation and knowing the tricks and also being uh, experienced. But I think there's also another element. Quite of honestly, Craig, sorry to cut you off, but quite honestly, I feel the same way. I feel... When we are on stage together, I've done stage shows with Nem. I've done stage shows where it's just been me and Kat. And I've done a lot of stage shows now, slightly unusual shows. And I'm always more confident when you're stood next to me on stage for that exact reason. I know if anything goes wrong, you'll know how to fix it. And it won't even look like anything's gone wrong. And I am 100% confident that whatever happens, you'll just fix it. So I'm, yeah. I'm totally with Kat on that. Thank you so much. But I think there's also another element, and I think you'll have seen this. There's another element, and I, I can't. It's intangible. I can't really put my my finger on it. But I think some people are just really good at yeah. thinking on their feet. Like, and I'll tell you who's really good at it. And Matt, I know you're going to agree with me, Ryland. The amount yeah, of times yeah. I've seen stuff go wrong with that kid on big stages. And nobody realizes. Like the first time we saw it, the first time he set foot on the gala show at Blackpool, he was doing the cube war with a bunch of kids that Russ Stevens had found five hours before the performance and taught them how to do the cube war. And they stuffed it up. And through no fault of his own, when he turned the cube ball around, all of the plates were out. And he just looked at it and he was like, in front of 4,000 magicians. And it looked like he was just like, Except but when he was doing the Harry Potter act at Blackpool this year, there was everything went wrong, but nobody realized. Like everything. The the quick change went wrong. The timing of the track was wrong. Electronics that were meant to fire didn't fire. Like there was a ton of stuff that went wrong. But everybody was coming up to him afterwards going, That was amazing. That was so good. That was awesome. Because A, he was fixing it when it happened. And B, he wasn't showing that they'd gone wrong. He had the com he had the mental acuity to kind of go, okay, I'm supposed to lift up this box and the owl's meant to appear. The box has collapsed. The owl has appeared before anybody even realizes. I'm just going to go with it, like, and and nobody even realized there was a problem at all. And I don't think you can teach that. I think you've just got it or you haven't. I don't know what you think, Matt, but I've seen it's him get experience. Out of it's so confidence. Much. 
it's confidence. It's about owning the stage. And it's a, that's what they say when they talk about owning the stage. Like, it, there's multiple aspects to owning the stage whatever your stage is whether your stage is a tiny gap in between two chairs at a table for at a close-up gig or whether it's a stage that's got four and a half thousand people sitting in front of you like if you are confident in what you're doing faking confidence is a massive thing like i'm not confident in anything that i do ever with myself i'm confident in ryland and i'm confident in craig and other people that i go out and perform with but i'm not confident in myself but I've been trained for a really long time to be able to fake that confidence. And I think it's just, there's something in a performer that you know full well. Like when that trick went wrong, when Bane went wrong, I knew at no point did my brain go, okay, just put your hands up, say it's gone wrong and walk off. It, that doesn't even enter your mind. As the performer, you know that you've got to fix that. And there's no other option because the show has got to go on. You can't just throw your hands up and go, sorry, <laughs> it's gone wrong. I'm going to leave. That's, that's not an option. You've got to, uh -huh. you've got to play through. Um, and I think Ryland's got that in spades. At no point does Ryland just stop and go, okay, well, that's gone wrong. Sorry, everybody. You just carry on. And you can only get that with flight time and being knowing and having your brain trained to just get on with it things happen during shows whatever shows they are i've i've been on stage with my band in front of six thousand people and i took a step backwards and stood on my guitarist's pedal board and ripped the jack lead out of the front of it which then completely destroyed the pedal board and his whole guitar shut down in the middle of a set in front of six thousand people and all of us just got on with it as a team. We just got on with it. We dealt with it. And within 60 seconds, he'd left stage, got another guitar off somebody in the green room from one of the bands that had been on before us, ran back on stage, tuned it, plugged it into a different pedal board that he'd borrowed from somebody else. And then we were back within two minutes max, we were back going again. And as the rest of the band, we just carried on as if nothing had happened, finished the track. I waffled on for 40, 45 seconds, getting the audience to cheer, getting some a bit of interaction going on. Nobody even really noticed that it happened. But you only get to that point with the experience of performing, I think. I think it just comes with experience. And Wyland, as young as he is, has got that much experience under his belt now. It's just second nature. Things like that just get fixed. The only time... I agree, by the way. The only time I've ever been in a situation where I couldn't get out of something was very early on in my career. I'd only been doing magic for a while. And I got myself a residency in this really posh up class restaurants. Really posh. Like I don't think I've ever told this story ever. So posh, this restaurant. You know when you're in a really posh restaurant and they cook the food at the side of the table on their little plate and they've got all the food? It was one of them. And so they were cooking the food at the side of the table I was performing on. Oh, no, they, they were next to the table. They were cooking food for the table next to me when I was performing for a table. And I backed backwards and didn't realise. And basically, and everyone was, like, dressed in really expensive clothes. I accidentally knocked into the server, who basically sent a fireball into this woman's dress. And the dress caught on fire. And I just looked at her, and I was like, everybody was screaming. And I just reached forward and grabbed the first piece of first container I could find and threw it over her dress. And it turned out to be the gravy boat. Um, so I basically threw gravy all over this woman's burning dress and everybody was mortified. And the guy, turned, <laughs> I'll never forget it. The guy looked at me and went, what the fuck? <laughs> and, it was another one. and I just looked at him and I was just like, don't worry, mate, it's all gravy. And and yeah, I lost that residency. That was that was gone. Um, bye, Vince. Take care, man. Um, that 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 residency was um, never seen again. But yeah, yeah, it's very difficult to get yourself out of uh, a situation where you set fire to a woman and then covered her in gravy. So there you go. Sounds like a magic right? trick, to be honest. Um, <laughs> uh... It was amazing. Anyway, Thomas has got his hand up again, so this is always going to be interesting. Again. 
I know. Two questions. Oh, Christ. First, do you have a favorite flavor of prime? I've never had prime in my life. Okay. Rylan Actually, Lizzie. that's a lie. That is a lie. Ryland made me try one of his. At, we were out somewhere, and I'm like, why is this obsession with prime? And he's like, try it. I'm like, I don't want to try it. And then that went on for like 10 minutes until I eventually went, okay, fine, just give it here. So I tried a bit of it. It tasted like toothpaste, like a mouthwash. So I just gave it in back, and then I haven't tried any since. So I don't have a favorite flavor of Prime. I think it's overhyped, overpriced rubbish. That is hilarious. When we're in the van with Ryland, she calls it, she calls it Kitty Crack. Kitty Crack. <laughs> yeah, that's what she calls Prime. It's basically, yeah, it's basically getting kids addicted to it's genius marketing don't get me wrong but it yeah i don't drink the stuff i've um, never i've never even heard of it what the hell is it that's because you're old dude <laughs> <laughs> thanks pal love you <laughs> well we're old because i don't drink the stuff either it's this like soft drink it's supposed to be this like energy drink thing that Jake Paul. Created is by really... a guy called Logan Paul. He's a YouTuber. Logan sensitive. Paul. Sorry, not Jake Paul. Yeah. Um, it's just massively overhyped mouthwash, basically. Next question. Uh, no, it's, no it's, it's, it's more of a, um, a query. Um, you, you spoke that about... That is a question. That's another word for a query. It's the same thing, dude. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Um, <laughs> no. Another um, word for a question is Shall a I take over, Tom, and give you a chance to no, 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 it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. Uh no, you've been talking about um uh you like you teach Ryland stagecraft basically, you, you yeah. teach um, it's just so much knowledge. Is there gonna be a point where you share this or and do courses on this on the metrics? Like with, with your acting, your voice training, all this sort of stuff. I think it's really valuable, and there's nowhere else to go for it because we've got the there isn't any, but other than professional vocal coaches and yeah, acting I think coaches, and I think it could be quite valuable for me anyway because that's where I struggle stagecraft. And you, you know, you're you're you, you did training for Ryland to go on national television to do it, there's a lot yeah. of value there. The metrics to learn that if there was a way of like you using Ryland as the as the subject, you can. The issue with that is that everybody's different. So the way that I walk onto a stage is very different to the way that I taught Ryland to walk onto a stage, which again would be very different to the way that I would teach you how to walk onto a stage or anybody else, because you have to. As a director or choreographer, coach, whatever it is, you have to work with the subject that you've got. You have to work with the person that you've got. It's not the same for everyone. There are certain things, tips and tricks on projection and body language and, and do you know what I mean? And being able to open your airway and, you know, natural uh, things that you can work into your mannerisms that project confidence. There are certain things that you can teach. But in order to be able to turn somebody into a performer, like we've done with Ryland, um, you have to work with the individual in order to be able to get the maximum out of them. So, yeah, there are things that we could do on the metrics. That's totally down to Craig. Um, but there are certain things that we could do um, to teach the basics of it. But then in order to be able to get somebody to a level where they're able to walk out into a, a stage and for the national television you wouldn't be able to teach that in a video because it's not the same for everybody does that make sense yeah it makes total sense yeah it's uh yeah cool thank you no worries dude andreas go on yeah thank you on the um, spot again. now now that uh, craig is starting building a successor of yours for the magic tv channel um did katie yes <laughs> with you reached out to you ask for advice uh, if she no. should take that or any not any at words all. that you exchanged no because katie how do i put this politely doesn't give a fuck like at all um she's 
one of a kind, Katie, I think. She's the character that that girl has naturally got is, I don't know how well it comes out on the videos, but it's, um, yeah, she's, uh, yeah, she's a law unto herself. So she's asked for no advice. She doesn't, she's not that bothered about being on TV or YouTube. She's not even that bothered about magic, to be fair. She works in the admin department. She doesn't really give a shit. Um, she just, yeah, she gives good reactions, I think. And um, she's just, she's very funny. Naturally, she's a very funny girl. So she's a great person to have on the channel. But no, she's asked me for no advice whatsoever. She made my performance fantastic, I think. Um, she, did <laughs> right. she made your performance fantastic. Ruthley Rose. Yeah. Uh, even oh, but she got the card wrong. Yeah, even though I made it a car crash, she made it fantastic because I've tried to perform to her in the office a couple of times, and then she's just fucked it up every time. So I've given up. Why Craig's got her to go on? I mean, obviously he's a better performer than I am, and he's more in control of his magic. But every time I've tried to perform to her, she's royally fucked it, which is exactly what she did to you on the stage. <laughs> she, made the, she, she made the entertainment amazing. Man. Yeah, but she's funny. Like people don't really watch what the magic when Katie's is on stage because she's so loud and out there that she's just yeah. People just watch Katie. She's funny. She is funny. Craig, are you still there? Have you fallen asleep? I'm here. I'm here. Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> So you turned your video off. Oh, <laughs> I was no, like, he's bored of listening to me. He's gone to sleep. <laughs> no, my video is off because while I'm listening to you, I'm creating tricks for... Of course um, you are. The course new, you are. Uh, course. new Murphy's release coming out in the next six months. So I'm just uh, saying, so, coming up so, with so, the, so the next nine-hour tutorial. Yeah. Two, two last bits from my end. Oh, okay. Uh, t Tom, I think it was Tom who asked you about... Or was it end rider? I can't remember. It's just two minutes ago. So putting out advice about stage mannerism and things like that. Yeah, that was Tom. You've yeah. talked you've talked about giving a sort of lecture on that topic. How is that going? Um yeah, so I mean I do I want to do um I want to do a lecture. Um because like Tom said, there's nothing really out there that helps with people performing. Like Alex Marsh did one, but he did one, um, or Alexander McAleer, whatever we call him. And he um, he did one, in, he, they hired a big theater and it's predominantly about theater performance, stage performance, which 95% of magicians in the world don't do stage performance. So that's a very niche, thing i think you can take a lot from it. i've watched it you can take a lot from it as a performer i took stuff from it um but it is centered around stage uh, stage where it, they don't talk about like warm-ups like how to best prep yourself to walk into a gig nobody talks about that nobody talks about how to mentally prepare yourself for what you're about to do nobody talks about how to introduce yourself to a group of people when you walk into a room. Nobody teaches you how to introduce yourself to the client when you walk into a gig, how to walk up to a group of people that you don't know that are more than happy sitting and having a conversation with themselves, interrupt the conversation entirely, and then command the attention of everyone. Nobody tells you how to do that. Nobody tells you how to put a routine together that's going to work for you. Nobody tells you how to project. Nobody tells you how to stand. Nobody tells you what to do with your feet or your hands. Um, so I think that I, I want to put a lecture together that's kind of like a download type thing, which is kind of just giving the basics on, on how you can make a start to doing that kind of stuff. And I think a lot of people struggle with confidence because like Ryland did, like I did when I first started, like everybody does when they first start, because they don't have any kind of platform at all for doing something like that. So I think that even if you can, like I said before, to, to get the most out of it, you would need to work with somebody one-on-one. -on -one. But finding people like that is, to get that out, is incredibly expensive. Working with professional directors and choreographers and, and producers and stuff is very, very, very expensive. Um, so just to be able to give something, to like a base to start from, I've spoken to a few people and people have said that, you know, it would be quite valuable. 
So yeah, I do want to put a lecture together. I've actually started writing it. I've actually started writing it already. It, it, it's in there. Um, and I think that um, I've spoken to a few people about getting it produced properly. So I'm going to do a like, proper job of it. And hopefully it will, you know, help some help some people. That's all I want to do is just be able to help some, but not necessarily get out there and perform because a lot of people are happy not going out and performing and not getting their own gigs and being a professional paid magician. But if you can, if I can give impart some wisdom from 20 odd years of performing and help people, even if people are just performing to their friends and family, if I can give them some ways and means of improving even that performance, it's going to make the magic that they're doing a million times better. And then it's a better experience for themselves. It's a better experience for their family and friends. And it's just making them a better performer. Even if they're never going to go out and get paid for it, why would you not want to improve? You know, I always look to improve. I've been walking onto stages for over 20 years and I'm still learning and I will always still learn. And you never know everything. And no matter what kind of performance you do or how good you are at it, there's always room to grow. And I think that, you know, if we, if I could put something out there that's even remotely valuable to a few people that would help them in some way, then job done. So yeah, I, there is a plan to do that, but it's going to take a while. Yeah, uh, it, it touched me a lot because I think I'm your number one customer for that. Definitely. Oh, that's very sweet. Thank you. Definitely. And um, my last, my last bits of of, of contribution here tonight is. Be, in 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 uh, the preparation of that Q and A, Craig mentioned he'll put some show real stuff together for proper introduce introduction of yours and your chubuawa and stuff like that. So Craig, will you show that tonight, or is that gone? I don't even know what he's talking about. What's he talking about? I know what he's talking about. Oh. Uh, I, I was putting some videos together for you. Unfortunately, I haven't finished them in time, so they're going to go on Magic what videos? You don't need to know. Uh, <laughs> you'll find out when they go live. Fair enough. Uh, I've got one last question. Who's the biggest oh. Eva, Craig or Ireland? Oh. Well, Ryland learns from Craig. But then Ryland, that's a really difficult question. Out of all the questions <laughs> I've been asked tonight, that's the hardest question to answer. Because they're both a fucking nightmare. So. Because one's your current boss and one's your future boss. <laughs> <laughs> no, we've already told Ryland. We've asked Ryland what he wants to do. And when he's 18, he wants to start working in the office. And then Craig was like, you do realize when you start working in the office that Matt's going to be your boss. And then he's just like, oh, okay, yeah, that's great. Because he thinks it's going to be brilliant, but it's not. I'm going to make his life hell. But um, but yeah, eventually I will be Ryland's boss. But he'll be touring the world and the biggest magician on the planet by then. And then he won't want to work in the office. So I won't be. But um, but yeah, they're both pretty big divas. I'm a fucking delight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you are a diva. Oh, there's no denying that I am a diva. Yes. Yeah, and Ryland's learned from you, so you're both as bad as each other. They both have their moments where I want to kill both of them. <laughs> Ryland, <laughs> Ryland's big problem is packing away, or not, not packing away. The second not packing away. <laughs> the second that the show's finished, he vanishes, and he magically reappears. When everything, but the problem with that is when we're doing a show with Ryland, ninety percent of the stuff that we have to take is to do it's with violence. him. I could turn up and do a show with literally one case and do an hour and a half. He takes like literally half a half a lorry for a twenty-minute show. I've got a ninety-minute show in there. <laughs> when we take Ryland to do ten minutes, we need to hire a long wheelbase van. And it's not even 90 joking. minutes, long wheelbase van for 10 minutes. Yep. Um, serious question. Serious question. Um, I was supposed to squeeze it in with my last question, but another thing I think could be really vital for the metrics would be your 
you're, you're an awesome salesman. So you should totally do a, a small course on how to sell. Once you get the leads in, your what you're doing in the office, you know how you speak to your clients, how you put on the pressure, how you get, how you sell, sell, and act. I think that Don't put on pressure. That's the first tip. Don't pressure them. Oh, I'm doing it wrong then. If you're pressuring your customers, you are doing it wrong. You have to uh, make them want it. Yeah, you yeah. Make well, them I'm, want to buy it. You make them want to. Buy it. You mean like a fear of loss. Yeah, you make them want to book you and then you make it so that there's no option for them but to book you because you're the best. Mm -hmm. People will call me up all the time in the office and they'll go, oh, they'll speak to me and we'll talk about the whatever it is, whether it's the kids magic or the adult magic or whatever it is. And then they'll go, okay, well, you know, I'm waiting for a couple of other responses to come back. And I'm like, you don't need to do that. We're the best. Mm -hmm. And they're like, oh, yeah, no, that's really, I'm not, no, I'm not joking. So I, I really. And this is why we're the best. And then they go, okay, yeah, cool. Let's just get it done then. I had an impression. Kids party, and they wanted me. They were going to get back to me. Then last week, because it was a friend, a friend of a friend, this post pictures of their party, nonstop kids. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was like, oh, could you imagine if I'd have turned up? <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, I then put you on it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But no, yeah. I think I think it'd be good. I think you know uh, the process of from getting that inquiry to turning that into cash. I think that would be a good course on Netflix. Well, Craig's an incredible salesman as well, so there's loads of stuff that he could teach you about that too. Well, there's yeah. a ton of courses on the silver level already. Like if you go into the silver level, everything I really know about sales, I've put in there. I've talked about the gifts. I've talked about impulse factors. I've talked about the eight step system, everything. My business mentor, my guy who taught me how to do sales, because I did door to door sales for years. So I know, you know, you got to be able to sell when you do door to door sales. The system that he um, he taught me, he said, it's a little bit like picking up a woman in a nightclub. He said, he said, uh, you know, to to be successful at sales, it's the same approach that you'd have and he talked about the uh the gifts greed indifference fear of loss tone of voice sheep factor and he's like hey you're never going to pick up a girl in the night it's very old school you're never going to pick up a girl in the nightclub if you're if you're desperate if you're going up to everyone going oh i want to date you they're not going to be interested you got to be indifferent you got to be uh you got to have fear of loss hey i don't care if i go with you or not you know you got to have sheep factor i've gone with all your mates so you may as well go with me as well you know all he he was he was he was like proper old school about this sort of stuff and uh, he was great, but everything he taught me, I put on the net trick. So um, there's hours of content on there from my approach and my point of view. But we've got very different sales styles, haven't we, me and you? Mm -hmm. We have, yeah. But yeah, again, down to Craig. I'm happy to do stuff like that. Um, it's just finding the time to be able to do it and then edit it and then get it up on the uh, <laughs> get it up on the net tricks. But yeah, I'll be happy to do it. Yeah. Absolutely. Awesome. Absolutely. Are we done? Are we done with questions? I don't know. Does anybody have any other questions? Last How one? many black vests do you own? How many what? Black vests do you own? How many black vests do I own? Oh god, I, I don't know. I could go and count if you want. I'll be a while though. Quite a few. I'm a biker and a singer in a metal band. Black vests is what we wear. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Do, do, do you I've like got your dye here as well. Moment. My alarm went off on my phone just to remind me to bring your dye into the office tomorrow. So I've got it here. I'm going to bring it in. Yeah, tomorrow. yeah, I'll be there. Kay's sending me all around the country for it tomorrow. So I'm, yeah. I'm, 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 out, I'm leaving the office at 12.30, but I'll leave it on my desk for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Matt, do you, do, do you like electric call boy? Do I like? Electric call boy. Electric the core German board. metal core party core band. Not a clue who they are, but check send me a link. Out. Send check me a link. Out. Yeah, it sounds interesting. Absolutely, yes. It's fun music, metal fun music. Love metal music. Been a metalhead my entire life. I've got one final question for you to wrap this whole up. Of course, you have goals. What are your goals over the next year, 
the next three years, the next five years? And as, and 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 actually, that's my second question. My first question is, um, season three of the matchmentary is going to be the kid show. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, why? <laughs> why not? <laughs> why not? Exactly. Although, I did come up with an idea about what I want to do with it, and I'm quite excited about it, to be fair. So I want to do the whole... I Because one of the things that I love doing, one of the best performance things I've ever done is be a villain in Panto. It's so much fun being the Panto villain. So the kids' show that I want to do with Ryland is me as a Panto villain, but a wizard, and then Ryland as the young apprentice but he's better than me. So I'm going on stage trying to do tricks, getting them wrong, and then Ryland comes and fixes it, but I kind of swat him away. Or I'm doing something in the forefront of the stage, but he's doing something behind me that's way better and getting the reaction, and then I'm taking it, and they're all like, no, not you, not you. Do you know what I mean? So that's the kind of way I want to do the show, is that I'm the, the, the bad panto villain wizard, and he's the young apprentice, and then all the kids will be on his side, and then... Everyone's against me. And I think that would work really, really well for a kid holiday show. So that's that's what I want to do for that. Yeah, um, and Fierce, then huh? he had that vibe and the kids loved it. Like, you know, with yeah. The, yeah, it had that vibe and the kids loved it. Yeah, Craig so, was the panto villain, yeah, and then me and Roland were the good guys. And yeah, it works. It's panto 101. You you that's why you have a villain in panto. You have to. Um, and I've played Panto villain in Pantos all over the place a, a couple of times. And it's my favorite thing that I've ever done in Panto. And one of my favorite things as a performer, because you just get to play on it. Everybody that does Panto thinks that the Panto villain is the best part. And it's, yeah, it's amazing. Uh, so that's what I want to do. If we're going to do a kid's show, I want to, I want to be a Panto villain. I think it'd be hilarious. Um, and then goals. Um, I want to get this lecture done. I think that that's something really positive to focus on. Um, and I think I'm going to learn a lot through the process of doing it um, and speaking to people and putting things together and the whole process of having something out in the magic world with my name on it is really important to me. Um, something that I've done myself that I can put my name to. And, you know, it's scary, but I think, that hopefully that will be really rewarding and it's something that's really exciting um i see like craig putting out tricks all the time and putting stuff out um and he gets a lot of satisfaction from that and he works really hard at doing it and i, I just yeah i want to do something like that myself um so that is like an immediate goal for the next kind of 12 months or so get this get lecture done and filmed and out there and then just see what happens <laughs> Um, that's my alarm going off again, reminding me to get Tom's die. And then um, I think I, I don't I don't know if it's possible, but going maybe if the lecture goes down well, maybe doing the lecture live um, at a few like little local magic clubs and stuff. I don't know. That would be it depends on how it goes and, and whether it would work live and whatever. But yeah, that would be something really cool to do. Um, and coming out, maybe coming up with some effects myself or routines myself. Um, I just, I just want to input into the magic community. The magic community has given me so much so quickly and I've loved every second of it. And if just being able to give back to the magic community in some way is really important to me. So um, yeah, just, being able to 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 keep growing as a performer, keep growing as a magician, keep growing as a mentalist, maybe collaborating with some people on certain things, um, and then getting a couple of things out there with my name on is the goal for the next couple of years, I think. I think a season of uh, matchumentary with uh, Matt Creator and Effect would be great. I'm very torn by the idea of also... Um, uh, uh, Matt coming up with a music and dance routine. I think that would be uh, a music combining... and dance routine for what? Sorry, a, a magic and magic and dance routine. Magic and dance routine. Holy shit! Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, bring bring together all the talents. Wow. I mean, <laughs> I'll come up with something if you perform it. <laughs> <laughs> Can you give us any 
sneak peek of some of the ideas you might have for what your product um it's literally just I wake up in the middle of the night with just random ideas in my head of things that I want to happen. One thing that I want to make happen more than anything else is have a routine put together where it looks like somebody, I know, I know people have done this and I know there's effects out there that, that happen, but I want to make something really clean where it looks like somebody's reading somebody else's mind. So I get two spectators up on stage and I get that person to mm. read that person's mind. Um, and I'm, been trying to work out different ways of, I know there are effects out there already where people make that happen but I want something that's a lot cleaner um I want to do something with uh, I've been looking a lot recently like PK touches and stuff and I think there's a lot that people can a lot a lot that can be done with PK touches I don't think there's as much gone into it from magicians over the years than a lot of the other effects that are out there. So I think PK Touches would be, is really interesting to me at the moment. And I really like the idea of that kind of stuff. Um, and then there's a couple of stage pieces that I've got where I'm getting people like, a, getting one, two people to drink out of a glass of water and one person tastes water and the other person tastes vodka. And there's a couple of different ways of making that happen. And I think that would be really effective as a stage piece, like influencing somebody that they're going to taste vodka instead of water that the person right next to them has just drank from the same bottle. Um, and there are ways of making it happen. So there's a couple of things like that that I'm, that I'm working on, but they're just very early ideas that are rattling around inside my head. Awesome. I, I can't wait to yeah, see. When are you signing up for the Magic Circle? When, when are you doing your application? It's going to be part of the matrimentary, apparently. So season part of the three. next season of the matrimentary is me. Part of it, as well as the kids' show, is getting into the Magic Circle. So it will be soon. It'll be um, soon when I come back from um, America in April. Then. So... May. I'm maybe. booked in, I'm booked on for the twelfth of August, Matt. Come on. You're in for the twelfth of August? Twelfth of August. Do it do it on the twelfth of August. Well, Kidology is September. So if we're gonna wrap up the matrimentary in September, it's gonna have to be before August. then, isn't it? So yeah. yeah. That's what I was thinking. <laughs> yeah. So maybe the twelfth of August. Maybe we can do it together. <laughs> yeah, cool. That's that's, down, that's down to him. He's going to have to sort the dates and stuff out. I've got a call with Marvin this week. so That'd be so cool because right. you'll get permission to get it, get it recorded and stuff like that. But uh, I, I, I give you already full permission to record my bit, my bit as well. <laughs> and then you could do, then you could do, then you could do the absolutely awful and then Matt's absolutely brilliant uh, audition piece and stuff like Mine's that. Mine's not going to be brilliant. <laughs> they don't like mentalists. I'm screwed. I well, know, well, that was what I was going for. Magic circle is a lot of the time. Thing. The audition has to show technical skill in order to exactly. Practice. So I'm screwed. Yep. Uh -huh. well, I've got till September skill, to develop some kind of technical skill, skill. Alone will not get you through on this one. Well, you have to learn some skill then, aren't I? And on that, we're out. Um, <laughs> On that completely impossible task, we will move on. <laughs> so, uh, I hope you guys have enjoyed this. Very I've had good. a good class. And great. I, I, we great. Was will, brilliant. We will definitely get Matt up on the Netflix to do some courses. I think that'd be really awesome. And um, yeah, if you're going to be at the London Magic Convention or you're going to be at the Magic Circle Convention, Matt is going to be there with me. Um, so, um, you know, come over and say hi. But uh, yeah. Thank you so much for attending. Thank you so much for joining. Um, and uh, yeah, you guys are all brilliant. Thanks. Thanks both. Fantastic again. Thanks so much, guys. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much. Thanks so much.